public hearing of the Board of Education of Grand Island in the City of Hall in the state of Nebraska was opened with discussion beginning at 5.30 p.m. on June 9, 2022 at the Neal Administration Building, 123 South Webb Road, Grand Island, Nebraska, the usual meeting place of said board. Notice of the public hearing was given in advance thereof by publication in the Grand Island Independent, the school district's designated method of giving notice. Notice of the public hearing was also given in advance to all members of the Board of Education. We'll move to attendance. Mrs. Albers. Present. Mr. Barsinas. Yes. Mrs. Hinkle. Present. Mr. Hawley. Mrs. Jurgens. Present. Dr. Bros. Yes, here. Ms. Wolf. Yes. Mr. Brown. Present. Mr. Holinsky. Mr. Holinsky and Mr. Hawley have given prior notice and their absences are excused. Number three, uh, policy review for public input. 3.1, review of proposed policy 8820 student fees. 3.2, review policy 9110 parental access to educational practices. Dr. Dexter. So student fees, and there are no changes except for the um, student lunch or the lunch prices, which uh, Mrs. Spellman presented last month and for approval this month. But those are included in the student fees policy. Um, just some highlights: uh, we we continue to have discussion about waivers, and waivers right now only apply to um, those supplies that are required for um, during the day school um, activities. The extracurricular activities um, are not part of that part of that waiver process. Um, we continue to work with the booster clubs to find ways to help students, all students be able to um, pay to participate. Um, you know, and the pay to participate is being able to buy um, the um, like show choir uniforms. Um, some of the um, clubs will want extra things, you know, ball bags that the, the boosters will come up with. Um, but we continue to work with the booster clubs to keep those costs down for families so that all kids can participate. Um, but there is a waiver process, and that's really just about in the student handbook, we post um, the school supply list, the supplies that each individual class would like extra. But if a student can't afford to buy those, then we are responsible for that. Um, so we, we have not used the waiver process just because with during the day, um, we, we take care of it. So that is student fees. So any discussion? Doesn't look like it. Okay. I'll move on to parental access to educational practices. And this policy is, it came about because of Title I, um, and there's some very specific, a whole page specific to Title I um, clarifications and expectations and what the school district will share with parents and how they will include parents and parent engagement. And so that's part of this requirement for this policy is to um, review it and then if there are changes to um, present that at public hearing. The only change we have to this policy, you know, we had some questions about the panorama surveys and that um, parents had the right to see the questions, right to opt out, and that is the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment, and that was in the policy, but it wasn't noted that it was about this specific um, law. And it is federal, and so the only addition is um, the protection of people rights amendment, just the notation um, within the, uh, the policy. And that's the only changes we made. Thank you, Dr. Dexter. Any questions? Doesn't look like it. So this will then be action later in the agenda okay. to approve this. Thank you. So do I need a motion for adjournment? Can you give me a motion for adjournment? I make a motion to adjourn the public hearing. Second. Carlos and Mrs. Hinkle. 
Any discussion? Please vote. We are adjourned. This one? Here. There we go. Is it the Go to another one? There we go. Yep. Uh, no, 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 no. Go to that one though. Go to that Go to this one? Yep. And then jump. Thank you. It is now 5.35 p.m. and I call to order the Grand Island Public Schools Board of Education meeting. This is the June 9th, 2022 meeting. Notice of this meeting has been advertised in the Grand Island Independent, which is the district's designated method of giving notice to these meetings. We want those in attendance to know copies of the Open Meetings Act are available at the entrance to the boardroom. If anyone is in attendance is interested in addressing the board, you are welcome to do so. We simply request that you complete the appropriate form and turn it in to us so that you may be recognized during the request to address the board part of our meeting. If you have not already completed the form, please see the staff person outside the entrance to this room. Public comment is welcome. We do ask that no signs be brought into the boardroom. Mrs. Simmons, will you please call roll. Mrs. Albers. Present. Mr. Barsinas. Present. Mrs. Hinkle. Present. Mr. Hawley. Mrs. Jurgens. Dr. Bros. Here. Ms. Wolf. Yes. Mr. Brown. Still present. Mr. Helinski. Mr. Helinski and Mr. Hawley have given prior notice and their absences are excused. Mr. Brown, would you read the mission statement, please? Yes. Every student, every day, a success. In educating students, we teach hearts as well as minds. <laughs> student commitments. Within the school district of Grand Island, every student has access to high quality, culturally responsive, and engaging learning environments. Every student will develop literacy skills across disciplines. Every student is socially and emotionally equipped to thrive in school and in life. Every student will graduate as a college, career, or and community-ready citizen. Thank you. The first item on the agenda tonight is the consent agenda. The consent agenda to be approved is as follows. 4.1, meetings from the previous month's meetings. 4.2, acceptance of agendas from standing committees. 4.3, claims as submitted. 4.4, bid proposals as submitted. 4.5, staff adjustments as submitted. 4.6, treasurer's report as submitted. 4.7, contracts. 4.8, policy. 4.8.14640, information technology management on final read. 4.8.28415, medications in school on final read. 4.8.38741, early graduation on final read. 4.9, approval of agenda as submitted. This is the consent agenda as published. Would anyone like to remove any items or add any items to the consent agenda? Does anyone have a potential conflict of interest on agenda item 4.3? If so, please state the check number you will be abstaining from voting on. Mr. Barsness? I will be abstaining from check number 82963 and approve the rest of the consent agenda as presented. I will be abstaining from check number 83065, but will approve the rest of the consent agenda. Mr. Brown? I will be abstaining from check number 83154 and approving all other items. I will be abstaining from check number 83001, and I approve all other, all other consent agenda items. Thank you. May I have a motion? Make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Mr. Barsness? Mr. Brown? Any discussion? Okay. Just one quick item for discussion because I know it's been asked a lot this week, but we've always done the staff adjustments on the consent agenda. That is not new for this meeting. It's been done that way for 16 years now, I believe. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. Any, okay, that was our discussion. <laughs> Go ahead and vote. <laughs> Motion passes. I'm getting there. Okay. Uh, number five is special recognition. 5.1, Path Back Program Recognition. Uh, recognition of Michelle Garcia and Mackenzie Zapata, selected as the Path Back Program recipients. Would you kind of handle this and we'll go up front? Well, good evening. Um, the Path Back Program is something that's been in place here from the, the board and Dr. Grover for this is, I think, the fifth year. And our two recipients this year are Mackenzie Zapata and Michelle Garcia Risa. And I'm going to let them come up and introduce themselves, where they're going to school, what they're going to um, teach down the road, and hopefully come back and join us in four plus years. So, ladies, come on up. Um, I'm going to be attending the University of Nebraska Lincoln to study elementary education and also getting an endorsement in English language learning. And I will hopefully be back in four years. Hello, my name is Michelle. Um, I will also be attending UNL and I plan to study um, secondary social sciences education and I hope to be back in four years as well. Congratulations and we're looking forward to having you back. Are there any, Mr. Brown, you have your light on. Any questions or thoughts? No. <laughs> coming up and we're going to get your picture taken and parents and family as soon as the as soon as Mitch is out of the way you can also come up and take their picture so I was looking for you Mitch I'm like where are you <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And thank you to the parents as well. So if you could just stand up for uh, Mackenzie and uh, Michelle's parents, if you stay standing, if you give them a round of applause. Thank you and we look forward to the journey. Thank you, Carlos. Six is campus highlights. 6.1 full service community schools. <laughs> Miss Richards, how are you, Amy? I'm great. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Well, thank you to the board for the opportunity to um, take a few minutes to talk about some of the campus highlights from the O'Connor Learning Center tonight. Um, you'll remember just about a year ago, we were here um, and the board was so gracious to approve the Full Service Community Schools Grant. And it's my true honor to introduce two people who made such amazing things happen in our program this year. So I'm really just here to introduce them and then let them tell you about all the amazing work that they've been doing this year. But this is Valerie Porto, who's our Family and Community Outreach Coordinator. And this is Samantha Ellicott. She's a parent in our program, and their combined work has had a tremendous impact in our building. And they're going to tell you a little bit about, about that uh, this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to Valerie. Um, first, I thought I would just um, explain a little bit about what a community school is to those who haven't heard. Um, a community school is the product of partnerships and shared leadership between the school, the community, students, and family. 
um, with a focus to provide education, services, supports, and opportunities. So um, as you can see by our numbers, um, we provided educational classes to parents and people of the community. We, we had um, family events, um, community cafes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we got a grant from the Heartland United Way and the Grand Island Community Foundation to start a food pantry. So nine, 91 food boxes. Um, and that's more like 91 families who got multiple boxes. So there were more boxes lifted than that. Um, 432 people impacted by those. And then 1,410 literacy kits distributed. With this grant, we did have money to purchase books and some other learning materials to send home with students, um, which we usually did like over Christmas break and spring break. Um, we did a survey um, at the end of the year, and we got really good feedback. 99% of families felt comfortable or very comfortable in the school. Um, if you aren't aware, parents do have to come into the school to drop their kids off. Um, and 99% were satisfied or very satisfied with the programs and resources and support that we provided. Um, here is a list of some of the things, the programs and services that we did offer. Um, it doesn't look like a lot, but <laughs> it was a lot. Um, we started last fall with a parent presentation. Um, we provided breakfast and lunch, um, which got us a really good survey response from parents um, who told us what kind of classes and programs they wanted. So a lot of those are on there. Um, and then we followed that with a monthly parent meeting. Um, which was attended by quite a few parents. Um, I don't think there is any other parent except Sam that came to every single meeting and every single presentation and um, everything that was offered. So um, just, I mean, really a community school wouldn't be successful without parents. So I'm very thankful for the parents that were able to attend those. Um, we had a lot of, we a lot, we had quarterly family nights um, where um, we went to the pumpkin patch. Um, we had a winter wonderland, which was put on by Samantha in like three days. I don't know if she's <laughs> amazing. Um, we did a bowling night this spring. Um, and then we had um, our parents led by Samantha started an OLC parent group, which the school had not had like a PTO group before. Um, and so she um, started some uh, fundraising opportunities. Um, like a Culver's family night. We took a free will donation at our, our family nights that she helped plan. Um, and I'm gonna have her talk about that in a little bit. Um, for right now. Um, so one of the things, um, we got a grant to do a community cafe, and if you haven't heard of a community cafe, um, it is a opportunity for families to get together and talk about some of the things that they are maybe going through um, around protective, pr promotive protective factors. Um, and so these were weekend meals where we um, provided a meal and then we had parent volunteers that planned questions that parents would discuss and they would switch tables in the middle, um, meet other families and we provided childcare and translation during these. So I will let you talk some more. Yeah, That's my favorite thing. Okay, hi. Um, we had training. In order to do the cafes, we had to undergo training and learning all the stuff that we needed to do during these cafes. And a lot of them was to make everyone feel comfortable, not just the normal group of parents that are always involved. You want to stand out and get everyone involved. That way you can meet everyone. Um, we have parents in our room but we don't have interaction throughout the whole school with other parents. And so we learned how to word questions in order to get more response and not just yes or no answers. <laughs> um, uh, let's see what else. Um, the benefits were huge. Um, the first one, we had a small group, but word got out. And of course, I was standing in front of the school hollering at everyone, telling everyone to come join me. Um, literally, uh, we had families meet other families and you didn't realize that these might be your neighbors. They might be just down the street. It got the community like it's supposed to involved in our school. Um, 
we had a teacher actually attend the last two meetings um, and that was a good feedback for our parents to have a little more insight into our teachers as well and we got their feedback and some of the educational questions that we had for our students um, and not only for parents but for kids this is a good extension for them to learn how to play and meet new kids that they might not have in their class um, the resources were amazing because then we had other families tell us what resources they might know outside of the school that could help or benefit them um, along with any sports that came into the summer that other families might not know. Um, so just having the questions be open-ended, and we had a lot of awesome different questions this year, uh, but just having the resources between the sports and the community and just summer activities were a great thing. Recruiting families, we look ahead. Um, we really wanna recruit more next year um, obviously, O'Connor is just two years, if you're lucky to get in, um, for most preschool. Um, if not, it's one even for the four-year-olds. But we're hoping to get more families to attend once we get the word out. When you just say community cafe, not a lot of people know or understand what that is. Um, so having them connect and also bringing back parents, for me, for instance, I have a preschooler and a kindergartner next year. I'm hoping to transition some families with me to help kindergarten next year become easier so they have a familiar face. It's just a nice way to gap the bridge. Um, information in different languages would be a nice look ahead because there is a lot of different languages out there. Um, we are hoping to do more family activities, personal invites, and then of course social media is the biggest thing right now. So we will definitely be looking ahead for next year, but yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> We just really want to thank um, Samantha for her leadership and wanted to have the board hear directly from her because this truly would not have happened without her leadership and hard work. When she says she was in the front of the building <laughs> hollering at people, I she was. truly was um, there to greet people and share a little bit and put a face with, with this work. So, But um, not only me. All of the staff at O'Connor has been wonderful. Every day you walk in with your student, you're not just walking through a hall. You're walking in every... I mean, Renee, all the staff, Amy, is just standing there greeting you as you walk in. So it's not like you're just dreading it, walking in. It's really welcoming and really amazing. So thank you to the board for the opportunity to learn a little bit more. Um, we look forward to this work continuing. Are there any questions for anybody? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Mr. Barsonis. I don't have a question as much as I, I've heard great things, especially when you talked about partnerships. Uh, one of the, that's one of the things I keep hearing. So to all the staff, uh, everything that you're doing, all the families, the community that you're building, the connections, I hear great things. So thank you for everything you're doing. Ms. Wolf. I just want to say uh, to you, Samantha, thank you very much for the hard work that you've put in with the other families and the staff um, of the O'Connor Learning Center. Um, it takes people like you to help, um, you know, the village. We need yes. the village to raise the children and everything. So I just really wanted to thank you um, for your leadership in that. So thank you. And I'll, I'll just add that if Samantha does not come back to O'Connor Learning Center next fall, um, she will be at other GIPS schools. And yes. one of the goals <laughs> with this program is to encourage and um, give leadership skills to parents showing that they can, you know, get active with their school and, you know, talk to the school. What, what can you do to help? Um, what resources do they need? Because, I mean, how many times our teachers got Sonic drinks and <laughs> that was all because of her fundraising and that even just that um, the staff really appreciated. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Samantha. Thank you. Well Thank done. You. Okay, number seven is requests to address the board. I have a little bit to read here. Not, we don't think this is a rowdy crowd, but I still have to read all this. So, um, Each person addressing the board will be allowed 
five minutes. We have five speakers, so each of you will get five minutes. Uh, the Board of Education has the prerogative to limit speaking to three minutes when there are, oh, there's more than three. Never, okay, disregard. <laughs> three minutes, sorry. Back step. When there are three or more patrons to allow speakers an opportunity to address the board in a timely manner. Uh, we allocate up to 30 minutes for addressing the board at each regular board meeting. Please face the board, not the audience, when you speak. We want to hear what is being said, so we ask the audience to refrain from making comments or sounds that make it hard to hear the speaker. No signs are allowed in the boardroom. We will not engage in dialogue with patrons presenting to the board. The purpose of the request to address the board is to listen to patrons. The board president and superintendent will identify staff to follow up on information requested from patrons when necessary. At regular business meetings, any school district related matter can be presented to the board, but only agenda items can be acted upon during a given meeting. At special meetings, comments will be limited to the subject of action items on the meeting's agenda. Speakers will not be permitted to make defamatory comments or use abusive or vulgar language. Expressions of personal complaints about staff or students are discouraged at public meetings. Concerns about individuals should be brought to the attention of the appropriate administrative authority. Specific building or program concerns should be brought to the attention of the building principal or, or program supervisor. So we'll just jump right in. Do you, do you have the light? Is, the, is it working? Okay. So can you, so the, we have a light up here and that'll kind of keep you on task as far as the time goes and it'll go to is it yellow when there's one when it, when it starts flashing yellow you have one minute left and then once that's finished it'll go to the red and it'll beep so it'll notify you pretty loudly when it's finished but you'll start at three minutes when it goes to green okay and if you have questions about that just let us know um, the first person to speak is Sarah Bant and so we do ask when you come up to the microphone that you um, state your name and your address, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Bant. I live at 4803 West I-80 Access Road, Alda, Nebraska, 68810. Okay. I would like to offer a uncomfortable conversation with a resolution involved. So my name is Sarah Bant. I have a student that was previously in the school. I come to the school board meeting tonight to address an issue that I have been researching since an incident had occurred at, with a student that had required my assistance. Some people are aware that I am an online advocate for people who are survivors of violent crimes as well as bullying. One thing that I've learned over the past two years is educating our youth on bullying and to keep them from being left untaught with what results in another generation of adult bullies. When they become adult bullies, they meet people like myself and my team, where they succumb to adult consequences. Some of you may have noticed that my team is very vocal, and we encourage the implementation of a stricter anti-bully policy to save children from potentially harsher consequences later on in life. Many people are unaware that there are many anti-bully groups on all social media platforms. My team specializes in more adult bullies and violent crimes. However, what brings me back to tonight, I was brought into an issue that involved a student that I am close to. Dr. Grover, you are aware of that issue. Uh, I did have a conversation with Carlos over that whole incident. Now, I'm not coming to you just as a parent, but also the president of PPI. It's a new nonprofit here in Grand Island. Being bullied can have a negative effect on students' academic performance and safety, as it is the human, human blah, blah, blah dehumanizing, dehuman intimidating, hostile, humiliating, along with emotional stress. I can personally tell you that I find people I don't even know across the nation because they attempted to unalive themselves because of the bullying that they received. To prevent bullying, staff and school staff members and students should regularly be trained themselves in how to identify and address bullying. This can sustain effective bullying prevention efforts. Although there is no federal regulations regarding bullying programs or staff training, there are many ways that the school can be safer. Students need to be held accountable for their actions before this becomes an issue later on. After all, st after all, all staff members should be required to train regularly on bullying and how to enforce it in schools. There are SROs on the school property, which is not correcting this issue, which is not at the SRO's fault. 
other measures need to be implemented. For example, New Jersey Middle School implements policies where students that are found of bullying are required to go to therapy at the parent's expense. It puts it back on the parents. When the victim keeps, while the victim is able to keep their voice without feeling silent, I have taken the liberty to also bring a couple other school policies from across the nation. I brought one from Michigan where they do address the parents and the parents are actually brought to the school board to address it. In other school in North Carolina, they have their own school board that addresses bullying. Thank you. For Thank your time. you so much for bringing that to our attention. Shelley Meyer. Please state your name, Shelley, and your address. Shelley Meyer, 4249 Pennsylvania Avenue, Grand Island, Nebraska. Um, I'm here tonight to address a concern. First of all, yes, I will say I am a retired teacher. I retired this year. But I am here tonight to address the calendar change being proposed for the elementary with uh, dismissing the 2 o'clock or eliminating the 2 o'clock dismissal on Wednesday. That is teacher plan time. That's taking away 54 hours of elementary teaching plan time and putting it back to only 24.5 by having it go to one Friday a month. Uh, one of the things I have heard, one of the reasons is because parents were not picking up on Wednesdays. That was one reason why this is being taken away. Uh, I find that interesting because I think it's been a common practice that Wednesdays are a 2 o'clock dismissal. Yes, parents forget. Yes, there are parents who don't pick up, but I don't find that to be a valid reason. You um, are springing this on teachers at the middle of the summer. That's already um, causing low morale. One of the reasons why I did retire when I did is because of the district making decisions like this that make it harder for the classroom teacher. By taking away this planning time, it will cause more burnout. Um, you will have uh, more time that teachers have to give up of their own time for MDT, IEP meetings. Um, honestly, your teachers cannot take a lot more. They work hard, we work hard, I worked hard, they give up family time, and by losing that time on Wednesday, which has been precious, takes away from them having those family moments at night by having to take homework to plan so that they're prepared for the next day or the next week. Um, it's frustrating to me to see this happen when it's been a common practice that the two o'clock dismissal is used for plan time. Um, I. Um, I don't see where giving them a Friday where half a day is to be plan time and the other half is to be school improvement to be a valid solution. They need their Wednesday plan time. And um, many of the people who know me know that there were moments where I just had a thought, should I have retired? But hearing this, yes, I should have. It saddens me that this is even being considered for the teachers in Grand Island Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for coming. Michelle Carter. Michelle Carter, 2616 Brennan Lane, Grand Island. Good evening, I'm Michelle Carter, president of the Grand Island Ed Education Association. Um, I'm here this evening to request and to urge you, the board members, to reconsider eliminating the district's elementary school's 2 p.m. dismissals on Wednesdays. This action will create a severe hardship on our already overworked and stressed teachers. We appreciate the district's efforts to provide some additional time on the newly added Fridays once a month. In negotiations this year, GIA stressed that teachers needed time to process and prepare based on the new learning provided during the professional development school improvement days. Thank you for listening to that concern. However, this positive action 
would be negated by the cancellation of early dismissals on Wednesdays for our elementary schools. The rationale provided for this change is faulty. During the listening tour and on surveys, teachers said that there were too many meetings on Wednesdays. And that is true. There are too many meetings. However, what our teachers were telling the district is that they need their dedicated plan time back on Wednesdays, not take away the Wednesday altogether. When GIA advocated for and negotiated this extra, extra plan time for the elementary, it was very clearly and very necessary meeting free time for planning and preparation. Unfortunately, since being removed from the master agreement, principals have taken this time as free reign to schedule long staff meetings, IEPs, and a host of other meetings. Teachers need more <laughs> plan time, not less. We are going to have overcrowded classrooms and more behavior issues this year. Now we are losing seven and a half potential hours every week and replacing it with two and a half once a month. Our elementary teachers have six to eight, lesson, six to eight lessons to prep every day. They must be provided more, not less, plan time. Please understand this is important not only to our educators, but also for our students and their learning. A second reason that was given for the change was that parents are not great at picking their kids up on Wednesdays, frankly and sadly. For many of our schools, this is a daily problem regardless of when we dismiss. But this is not a problem that should be addressed by taking away desperately needed preparation and planning time for our education's professionals. It is the district's responsibility to address this problem and it should not be shouldered by our elementary school teachers. On behalf of our elementary school teachers and students, I urge this board to reinstate the district's elementary school's 2 p.m. dismissals on Wednesdays. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, may I ask you a question? Yes. You were at the meeting with the calendar committee just yesterday or the day yes. before. Yes, I and was. It, and it was a short meeting. It was only 15. Very short. And did you bring any of these concerns up at that meeting? We uh, really did not. Uh, myself and Carmen Barnes, who's also here, asked clarifying questions because it was literally slipped into a long line of other things. And quite frankly, I was stunned and did not have time to gather my thoughts to respond. Because as a board, one of the questions we asked was, was Michelle Carter there? And yes. so we kind of anticipated that you might have said something had there been you know, some action that you might have wanted taken. And uh, I would have spoken then if I had been not blindsided by this change. This was never discussed in any calendar committee meetings this year. Never. No, you're right. It wasn't because that's why they had to bring the calendar committee back. Yes, and to be, because, add those Fridays. Right. Now, but go ahead. As I was blindsided, I had to have time to gather my thoughts. We asked the clarifying question. Yes, they are doing away with Wednesday plan time. I had to regroup and think about what I had just heard in order to gather and be able to give you my response. So but I, we were never, ever. This was never mentioned, and it was slipped right in in the discussion. In fact, I didn't think I'd heard it correctly. So um, I, I will tell you that I've heard from several elementary school teachers that are pleased with it, too. So yeah. I, un I understand that there's some here, and I'm glad that I, I see your face, Tanya. Uh, but <laughs> and because I asked, I asked them specifically, mm -hmm. you know, how do you feel about this? And um, and their attitude was, um, well, it was just a different opinion, you know, different, yeah. oh, different sure. strokes. So, and, and I'm okay. sure there are people who will be happy with that because some principals filled their Wednesdays with meetings and they never got plan time on Wednesdays. I'm so I'm sure they're glad thinking, oh, I don't have to go to a two hour staff meeting. Whoopee. But for those of us who did get plan time and now I'm going to have 27 kids in a classroom that was built for 25. I'm going to have at least three or four behavior students in my classroom. When am I supposed to prepare for those students so that they can be successful? I don't have time. 50 minutes a day for plan time is great, but now we're going to have to fill those with other things. And quite frankly, I will not give up my plan time. Okay. Well, thank and you for... Thank so um, this was blindsided. We were blindsided by this. Um, in my opinion, it was not handled, the change was not handled appropriately. 
um, I felt what should have happened was that um, this change should have been put out to the calendar committee before the meeting yesterday so that we had time to review the changes. The only, I knew about the changes for the Fridays because I went and looked at the calendar. Um, but we did not receive the materials until this morning. Okay. Um, and if, if I had had time to prepare, I would have, and you would have heard this yesterday at the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Cameron, you're next. <laughs> Good evening, Carmen Barnes, 4073 Allen Avenue. You're good, Lisa. And I'm also here to talk about the calendar. And first I wanted to say do, thank you, um, GIPS and the board, for trying to look at solutions. I really do appreciate that. And I'm going to tell you my perspective of why the Wednesday time is important. I am a speech pathologist. I've been with the district for 28 years. I primarily have had elementary school assignments. Now, my schedule, two different schools usually, going back and forth, finding time to plan with teachers is really, really difficult. I rely on that Wednesday time because I know that all teachers have that available. I rely then to consult with them to see how they're doing. We rely them to have beha behavior meetings because that's the only time we can get our SCCL, our school psych, our resource teacher, uh, myself and the teacher all together is during that time. We can't use the 15 minute plan time a teacher has during the week because we're busy. So doing away with that plan time is really not going to help your specialist. Wednesday afternoon is the only time our special education team can even meet because we don't have any other common time. And I really feel, especially your SE teams, will suffer because of that, because we will not get that critical plan time that we need. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming. Tanya Pell, please state your name and your address. Hi, Tanya Pell, 2511 West Phoenix Avenue, Grand Island. Um, I'm here to speak on the Wednesday, um, ha not having the 2 o'clock. I'm a teacher for you. I teach at Newell Elementary. Um, I'm going to start my 16th year. Um, I have a three team. There's three on our team. Two of my teaching partners have left this year, two young teaching partners, which means I will have two new teaching partners next year which means I need the Wednesday time. That's our time to collaborate. That's our time um, to get together, see how things are going, how things are not going. During the day, there's not that time. And when I, I just heard about it yesterday, and I was like, oh, I guess this is my time to speak up. I have my first meeting. So um, yes, I'm nervous. Um, but this, I, I just feel like it is, it's very important. It's our time. Um, elementary, we teach every subject. Um, the demands that um, we have, it's tough. There's not enough time in the day, and if we don't have the Wednesday time, um, I'm gonna be spending Sundays. I did that for years, um, and that's no fun. Uh, it takes away from teaching, and you know, the joy of teaching goes away when you're spending your weekends in the building. So I'm just here as a teacher, um, one of your teachers, and saying, please don't take the Wednesday planning time away. We need it. Thank you. We are going to have a presentation on this. Um, unfortunately, we had to change our um, executive session to right after uh, because our attorney's here. <laughs> and so we have to meet with him. But if you could stick around and see the presentation just to make sure that we all um, are on the same page with facts, uh, it would be appreciated. And thanks for coming. Yeah. So number eight is exec executive session for the purpose of legal counsel consultation because it, it, it is in the best interest of the public to discuss this matter in closed session. Do I have a? Make a recommendation for the board to convene to executive session for the purpose of discussing legal updates from the council. Second. Mr. Barsons and Dr. Bros. any discussion? 
Please vote.
please. I recommend that the board reconvene from executive session. Second. Mrs. Hinkle and Ms. Wolf, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, number 10, we don't have any approval of any items. Number 11, 11.1, 11 .1, Panorama. Dr. Dahl. Great to see everyone, welcome back. It's my honor to present to you tonight on the progress that we've had this year and the lessons learned from using Panorama. Sorry, one second. To uh, give a, an introduction to Panorama, these are surveys that we use to monitor district-wide parent, staff, and student perceptions of both climate as well as student-provided social-emotional learning needs and concerns so that school leaders are able to support students and also in increase the support that they provide in their schools. This presentation, as well as a lengthy description of Panorama and the history of using it, is on our website at that link. And just again, in, in uh, a review of Panorama use, we began using it in the 2018-19 school year at three different schools, uh, Star Walnut Middle School and Gish. And the year following that, we added Stolly Park, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, Panorama gave us, as a district, a, a district-wide survey during the spring of the, the initial year of the pandemic, and we were able to learn about how to provide some of the supports our, our students had, and it helped us during the, those opening weeks of the pandemic. The following two years, we've used Panorama in all of our schools, and uh, with parents, staff, students, and I would emphasize that it uh, is something that we've also written into our strategic plan in a couple of our success measures. Why are culture and climate surveys uh, and social emotional learning surveys important? Well, NDE requires us as a district, requires all districts to give climate and culture surveys to schools. Panorama is one of the, if you look at the bottom of that NDE webpage, Panorama is one of the, the suggested or not necessarily promoted by the state, but they were just looking for national examples of surveys used and state examples and Panorama was one. And it's something that, that uh, has also a historical track record. It was created by a researcher at John Hopkins University, and it's used by over 21,000 schools in the United States, in all 50 states. So just some things that Panorama is and Panorama is not. It's a tool for measuring perceptions of school climate by students, staff, and parents. It's also a tool for, for looking at those perceptions of students about specific social-emotional learning needs that they might have. Uh, Panorama is not something to measure mental health. It is not a screener. It, it provides no diagnosis in any way. It does not take the place of a school providing tier three services for students that need them. And it's also not required for students, families. It's optional. It's something that is given as an option. So I want to talk briefly about reports that uh, Panorama provides to us. And there are three levels that those reports are available. One is the student level, the parent level, and also a campus level. So a student level summary kind of could look like the example. I, I cropped it a little bit. There's, there's additional asset, uh, facets that the survey focuses on. But if you imagine this being a report of a student's social emotional learning needs, you might see some areas that are increasing. You might see an area that's decreasing. And this information is drawn from questions that are asked about social management, or self-management, that is social awareness, growth mindset, and other areas. But it, by and large, could help a teacher when they're, when they're working with a student that they might have, be having difficulty developing a rapport, rapport with or something. 
and it, it would help them to be able to drill down to some of the specific information provided by the student and the historical context also if the students new to that school but they were in a different district school previously such as you know the shift from elementary to middle school the parent summary is something um, I want to emphasize as a district we do not have anything deeper than the parent summary we do not have school summaries of what parents think the parent summary is a public survey that parent that not public it is a parent welcomed survey but we do not collect the information of of who that parent is or where they we can't drill down to that we uh, simply have a parent summary at a district level and it's important to emphasize here that in the areas of school climate and school safety on the most recent spring survey our parents increased in the previous time that they had measured climate and safety so there those 69 percent of favorable responses from parents about climate and 70 percent of favorable responses by parents on safety those are increases from the previous time parents were surveyed lastly there are campus level surveys and because this is a district presentation, I'm not going to go through individual campus surveys, but I will go through some summaries at the elementary, middle, and high school level. I want to emphasize that school leaders go through their own data. They don't go through the district overall data. They simply look at who their students are and what the perceptions and trends are at their campus so that they can make adjustments where needed. Um, I didn't mention it, so I will. Uh, the, the administrator access to these surveys is also beneficial for school improvement plans, which are required by the ne Nebraska Department of Education. So next, I did mention that uh, Panorama is used on two of our success measures. The first one there deals with 75% uh, or more students uh, at schools rating their, the climate as high, and also their over the four years of the On Track to Thrive strategic plan, we want to see a 15% increase in social emotional development. So those are two things that we, we track as a district, but also we, we encourage our, our school leaders to look at as well. Next, there isn't a single question on Panorama that says, how's the climate at your school? <laughs> Instead, there are many questions that ask students about how safe they feel, how much they enjoy learning, how engaged the learning experience, in other words, how rigorous, and how, how excited they feel when they're learning, and how, how socially connected they are to other students, how well they're responding to the learning that's provided. So I could read through each of the four questions that deal specifically with com climate in terms of positive and negative energy, the fairness or unfairness of rules, and uh, the other two I, I, I did kind of mention in terms of behavior and the excitement of students. On the right side of this slide has to do with social emotional learning needs. It's an important to park here for a second. What is social emotional learning? Social is just the context of students interacting with other students. And does the school provide a supportive atmosphere for students to interact with each other? That's the goal of schools. Uh, the emotional side is students as they're interacting with their own learning experience. And are they supported as they're learning, you know, kind of as they're going through adolescence or pre-adolescence? Are they being supported in the ways that they're responding to, to learning in the classroom? And are teachers adjusting in time with those student needs as they change? So there are more questions than I can talk about that are in the areas of social emotional learning and self-management. There are 10 questions. And there are social awareness questions. There are, there are eight different questions. But if we really read, the, read those questions, they're just talking to students. And they're publicly available, by the way but they're talking with students about those specific needs to get their perceptions. So what do we learn? At the elementary level, you'll notice, uh, first of all, I'll give you a second to just look at a lot of bar charts that you didn't come here prepared to look at. So let me give you uh, 30 seconds just to look at that. So as we look at elementary schools as a whole, in other words, all 14 schools averaged together, we notice that rigorous expectations is the highest area ranked by students. That's an emphasis here should be on which students, grades three through five students. So Panorama is not given to younger students. It starts at age three, or grade three, that is, and goes upward from there. But just that rigorous expectations are being emphasized by students, that's, that's really amazing. And if you look on the right side there in the social-emotional area, 
supportive relationships being listed as the highest thing, and they're organized by rank, rank order. But those are things that we want to have in our schools. We want students to have those not only in their lives, but in the schools. Let me again emphasize that this is a district summary of elementary schools, so each school would be seeing different numbers, and they'd be responding to those different numbers and providing supports and or addressing things that may have changed from a previous time students gave perceptions. Next, I just shifted to the middle school slide, and it's really the same topics. If you looked closely, the order might have shifted because, again, all, uh, both columns are organized by rank. So you might have seen climate in the middle before, now climate's uh, safety has risen higher. So the highest area at the middle school rated by students was again in rigorous expectations and in supportive relationships, two things that we wanna see. You will notice that some of the areas that are, that are listed as more challenging for students, one is climate at the middle school level and another is the area of positive feelings or challenging feelings, kind of the emotional environment of students. Um, I do wanna emphasize, because this is an optional survey, and because students are gradually getting older as we're looking at middle school surveys, think about it. The students are being honest about their perception, but middle school students are not talking to elementary school students about the survey. So we remember if we had an audience of children in here, that each, each grade level of students would respond slightly differently. And so Panorama is showing us that. And schools, because they look at these averages as well, they want to have a chance to, to kind of pull up the areas that might decrease and, and, and celebrate the areas that increase. Next, as we look at the high school, we really see some similar trends that were in the, in the middle school level survey. In other words, uh, and shared by all three surveys was the emphasis on rigorous expectations in the district, in their learning experience and supportive relationships, how important those are. I wanna highlight that self-management at the high school is something that students also rated highly at 70, 70%. That's amazing because that's one of the outcomes that we want for academy students, to become able to, to self-manage, not only in their higher learning environment should they go that direction, but in their, in their career environment, to be responsible citizens. So next, as we, again, I mentioned earlier that, that staff surveys are not broken out by level or by school, but rather that we have a district aggregate. I just wanted to highlight where staff members fall on a national sample in terms of climate. So st staff members rank our climate as 53%, which really is kind of right in the middle of students at the high school and middle school level, which was in the 46% range, and at the elementary level, which was 65. So staff members are kind of in the middle. And we, we kind of, I, I would be making a, a conjecture here, but we could kind of think that staff members might be responding to the environments that they're in. and. That's something also that school leaders would want to take note of and support staff members by looking at climate views of staff members. So let's talk about supports. What, is, what does support really look like? So at the school level and in the area of climate, we have many teams in our district that provide supports uh, for students. So in the area of positive supports, that's something that's provided by our learning, leading for learning team and it's really, whoops, my apologies, my bad. Uh, that intentional work is not only aimed to decrease referrals by students, but really increase the supports so students don't need to act out through referrals. Secondly, um, an earlier slide mentioned counselors and social workers, and I didn't say anything at that time, I, but I, I was knowing it came up later in the presentation, so I wanna assure you I didn't miss that. Counselors and social workers look through the panorama data to find students that might be at highest need. And for a very specific example, that's where they say they're struggling with challenging emotions and where they don't say there's the presence of supportive relationships. When those two things happen together, that's where our counselors and social workers step in. And this is information, this is intervention that we wouldn't be able to provide without Panorama. Um, thirdly, there's Hello Hero and the Heartland Health. We have tier three uh, agencies, both at the community level and also at the uh, remote level, but that provides specific supports to students uh, who, who might be in any need of counseling support and or higher needs. Next, the supports that are for staff that come from climate in terms uh, of what supports we try to build as a district for our staff. One of them is to increase the collective e efficacy of our staff, the voice and the choice that they have in, in determining how best to, to use our curriculum and also in providing the best supports they can for students. So in other words, using that panorama information. 
The systemic school-wide improvement process, this kind of applies to everyone both at the district level supporting our schools, our school leaders and doing the work in their schools and, and with their building leadership teams, but then also the end user, the student who receives kind of what interventions and supports are created. Lastly, if we have staff that have higher needs, uh, and I'll confess I've, I've availed myself of that over the three years I've been here when, when it was needed, but those EAP sessions, those extra sessions that staff can take advantage of, those are district provided and, and a really great support for staff members. Uh, secondly, we have additional behavioral supports that align with insights that came up through the listening tours that occurred in each of our schools. So some things that, that came as a result that are behavioral supports to students. One is the new social emotional learning positions at the elementary level and hiring is under, underway. That will come up later tonight. Uh, also counselors who were in a full-time teaching role last school year, which just ended, they'll be moving to a student-facing role and they won't be teaching the counseling step, second step curriculum. Next, uh, the board has approved an assistant safety coordinator role and hiring uh, will, be work, will be in progress in June for that position. And there's also uh, the SROs at different schools are working on building relationships and a, a specific insight that came out from the listening tour. So things that they might do might include making summer connections with students, might even include coaching things that they can do to build those relationships with students so that they can provide better supports during the school year. And uh, in terms of training, we want to uh, train everyone up, including our, including our students. So we have a student judicial board that's in the process of being organized. And also just across the board professional learning, we want to look at the insights from Panorama at the staff, student, and parent level. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. I scoured the panorama data so that I could understand experiences of some of our second language parents because panorama is provided in more languages than English. And some of the insights from that were really helpful in talking with some of our school leaders that work with English language families to just help them understand the perspective of those families. So again, highly beneficial training that can come as a result of this survey tool. So lastly, we want to think towards what, what uh, do we get from Panorama as a whole. I want to emphasize that Panorama is only one tool in our district toolbox. I did mention earlier it's optional, and I want to emphasize that with bold here. The participation is completely optional. But other ways that we, can, we engage in continuous improvement outside of Panorama are with our weekly PLCs, where teachers are working together. Also, that ongoing support that counselors and social workers provide even without looking at Panorama. In other words, by listening to all the stakeholders that they engage with and the families to understand how to, to support student needs. And lastly, uh, twice a year when we have parent-teacher conferences, that's, those are a gigantic tool where we engage with, with families and parents and learn how we can improve supports to students. Panorama is planned for the, the coming school year at the following dates there in September and October for students, staff, and family. And then also in the spring, it will not be given to family a second time. That's only a once annual. But it will be given to uh, students and staff in the spring. With that, I'll just take a deep breath and uh, pause and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. Bonnie. Mrs. Hinkle. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, first of all, I appreciate the the presentation. It was very good. I I really do appreciate that. And I I just I guess as you were working through this, it, it makes me think about all the discussions that are taking place these days with school safety because of what happened recently at Uvidal. And um, this is just so such important information for us to have because when you talked about like being able to recognize when a student doesn't have that relationship and they're also saying they're in challenging feelings you know that's helps us to, to identify who might need the outreach and so I think that's very very important and I just I know we've used it for a while and I guess the results don't really surprise me I mean there's definitely room for growth there's um, good points and then obviously items that we we own and we know we need to keep working on and as we always do and so this helps us though focus on the right things as as rather than 
you know, sometimes you hear things, oh, this, this is such a problem, but maybe this doesn't tell us that it is. It's helpful to have that data to back it up. So appreciate it. Thank you for your work. Happy to help and triangulate things. Yes, there so you go. So understand the experience the best. Mrs. Jergens. Um, I just have a couple of thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. I feel like you have had to live in this, and uh, maybe you didn't want to make your home in panorama surveys, but you have, and thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, I'm looking at your slide number 10, which it, it communicates some of those questions on climate. And just personally, I think if we, if we don't ask our students these questions and get the good answers and get the answers that hurt our hearts, then we don't have any guidance. And so I feel it's really important. And I feel like some of that is lost in the chatter and some of the negative the, uh, rhetoric that pushes back against the value here. I want the school and all three of my children are students of GIPS for reasons like this. I want my school district to ask my kids, how do you feel? And request honest answers and sometimes we get those answers we don't love but that's important there's a lot of value there that's a place for us to grow so that's one thought I have another is I would like to just make sure that I commend our teachers because when you break out in slides 12 13 and 14 uh, specifically the supportive relationship percentages looking at those that is high and you know <laughs> It's no secret, our teachers are facing a lot right now. We all are, but our teachers in a very specific way. And so for our teachers to be communicating to their students that they are there to provide a supportive relationship, and I think about the students that may not have supportive relationships at home, I mean, that really moves me. So again, just thank you to our teachers, um, because that is giving our students something that is incredibly important. And if you don't have that, I don't know how you're supposed to sit and learn math and learn how to improve your literacy skills in any capacity. So that just feels like such a baseline piece. Uh, so important. So thank you. Thank you for communicating that. Oh, Mrs. Hinkle. No. Oh, no. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. Great presentation. Thank you. 11.2 revisions to the 2022-2023 calendar. Okay, um, just to give you a, a, some background, um, the planning processes that went into just bringing up, do we revise the calendar? And, you know, is the timing right? Um, but we, we took information from Dr. Grover's listening tours um, we pulled together a team of out-of-the-box thinkers, um, which included um, members from the calendar committee, the teacher coalition, and then other administrators. And um, so out of the, all of those gatherings, um, staff asked for dedicated planning time. Staff reported that early out Wednesdays had become time for meetings. Specialist staff need time to meet. Time to focus on implementing the big ideas from professional development into practice at the classroom level. And then th Thanksgiving break, and we had the opportunity over the last two years because of COVID to, to do some mental health um, days on that Monday, Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Very much appreciated. Um, we don't have the luxury of the um, waivers for because of COVID right now. I hope it stays that way. But, uh, but we did realize that that Monday and Tuesday is it really worth it bringing kids in for two days? And um, you know, you're thinking about break, and and so the uh, out of the box thinking group just said, hey, why don't we do Monday, Tuesday as professional development, and then a full day plan and prep. Parent teacher conference week, um, we'd had parent teacher conferences Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday morning, and then Thursday afternoon was a school improvement day, and and staff told us that. We're, we're fried, we're burnt out. Could we have that as a plan and prep day? So there are those two days that we moved from school improvement to plan and prep days on this revised calendar. We will continue the early outs the first week of school, which is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the Thursday, Friday are full days. We will continue early outs during parent-teacher conference week, the last day before winter break, and the last day of school will be early outs. 
The revised calendar does meet the 187-day contract and minimum hours required for instruction. Um, you know, things we heard from families early out Wednesdays um, are stress on families. Thanksgiving break is a full week of no school for students. Um, first week of school will be early outs again, um, as well as parent-teacher conferences, winter break, and the last day of school. And so if you look at the calendar, um, the big differences are when you look at September 16th. Um, that is, we were calling it CIA, Building Prep, Plan and Prep. Um, in working with L4L, they're brainstorming. We have to find a, where to put CIA because that was one of the meetings that was taking place during the early out Wednesdays. But we need at least an hour um, on that day and, and talking about could it be a variety of virtual travel, um, maybe it's just in the building. And then we left building PD mainly for a focus on multi-tiered systems of supports, that positive behavior supports training that we can um, really identify kids and the, the supports they need to um, be positive in the classroom. So that's September 16th. Um, September 26th is still a district professional development day. And then October 13th is that parent-teacher conference day where it was school improvement and now it's plan and prep. Again, on October 28th is an added Friday. And then you see um, November 7th was there originally as a full day plan and prep. And then November 21st is a professional development day, which replaces the 28th, which is on the current calendar. And then that 22nd is um, for, again, the CIA building PD plan and prep. Move to December. And we just have the early out on Friday before winter break. We still have the two weeks of winter break. We come back. January 2nd is plan and prep. January 20th, this was a move. It was on the 23rd. We moved it to the Friday on the 20th. And then added Monday the 23rd. Again, um, the plan and prep CIA, building professional development. Um, really felt like once you had the professional development, then you could take Monday to process and, and uh, reflect and plan forward. And then in February, the plan and prep day on February 16th was originally a school improvement day. Then we looked at March. Um, we were in school full day that last Friday before spring break. That's now one of the Fridays um, for plan and prep, CIA and building professional development. And then the 27th, again, is CIA building PD and plan and prep. April, we have April break. And then we have the added Friday, April 28th. And then May is, um, looks the same as the current calendar. So those are the changes to the calendar. Um, just to, when, because you're sitting down with pencil and calculator. Um, so the early out Wednesdays were 54 hours a year. So that was 36 weeks times 90 minutes. And then if you add the take away the 54s of early out Wednesdays, you add seven days and it's the six Fridays plus the .5 parent-teacher conference plan and prep, which would give you the seven days. And then that comes to 52.5 hours. And then also on that Wednesday, planning time has been cut to 25 minutes. Teachers would get back the um, other 25, so they'd have the 50 minutes. So just adding that up, it added up to 15 hours. So um, overall, 67.5 hours um, for plan and prep. And we would still have 1,151.5 hours of instruction with students. Um, those figures, it's just straight across 36 weeks, but it didn't bring into account the beginning, um, early out days, and parent-teacher conference days. So that's where we are with, with time and days to the calendar. And do you have questions? So not everybody loves this. So what kind of um, feedback did you get when you were creating this calendar? Were there some people that wanted to keep it the same that were on your committee? Or was everybody pretty much for we need to do something different. On the out of the box thinking, um, 
more so secondary, but just because Fridays is difficult to get you know, with activities to get kids back engaged. Um, so that came up. Um, just lots of instructional time. Um, some one comment is is now the right time to do this, um, but the overwhelming group on that out of the box thinking group is that we wanted to move forward now and we wanted to eliminate the early out Wednesdays and implement the Fridays. Um, I had a teacher talk to me about special ed on Wednesdays that um, it was difficult for the kids because the sessions were so short and that it wasn't even, she said it wasn't even really worth it to have maybe pull kids out uh, on Wednesdays. And so she was all for this. And, and really most, everyone that contacted me was for it. I had someone ask me specifically, please vote for this. This is, and she's an elementary school teacher. As a parent, um, all, my kids are all out of GIPS now, but we hated the Wednesday early outs. And, uh, and I think all my friends hated the early Wednesday outs. And uh, it was difficult to manage. It was uh, difficult to make sure everybody had a ride. And on occasion, sometimes you forget about your kids. And I did it, and I think everybody did it at least once. And um, it just, I think it might be better for families to just have a consistent schedule uh, so that they know, um, especially new families coming into the district. Uh, so I know this impacts elementary uh, far more than it would you know, middle school and, and uh, high school. I love the out of the box thinking. I'm really glad that you were able to brainstorm with a group of people that had these ideas and the feedback on being able to plan all day and plan entire units on Fridays. That's some of the positive feedback I heard as opposed to having it piecemealed um, on Wednesdays. Uh, I am not in their shoes. I'm just repeating what was told to me. So, um, Dr. Burroughs, do you have something to add? Not on that, I just have a question. One of the things you said, Dr. Dexter, is that the Wednesdays were sometimes eaten with meetings rather than planning and prep. How are we gonna prevent that with this new schedule? What seemed to work on the Fridays, the mental health days, um, this last spring semester, that you know, L4L put together a, a plan of what that Friday needed to look like. And um, to really do some combination with, again, the CIA, MTSS, and plan and prep. And so that seemed to help to say, this is a schedule we'll follow. Staff knew it, principals knew it. And um, you know, if, if there was an issue with someone said, well, to heck with that schedule, I'm making my own, you know, they were held accountable. And so the feedback I received is that was appreciated. And so that's why L4L is going back to the table to really look at, okay, what are these Fridays gonna look like? Just because like CIA, they really need to do an hour with elementary and then that same staff from L4L would need to do an hour with middle school um, and then high school. So they're looking at how do they stagger those times. Mrs. Hinkle. Okay, thank you. A um, Couple questions. So you, you mentioned the group that got together um, and I know this, it, started a lot because of Dr. Grover's listening tours and what she heard and then also when we had the mental health days in the spring and, and the feedback that we got and so forth. Um, how often did that group meet? When was their first meeting? The first meeting was May 24th, 11 to 1, and that was the only meeting we had. And then other than today, you met with the group today or yesterday? And then yesterday, yeah. yes. Okay. And yesterday was a combination of this group and the calendar committee. Okay, all right. Um, and then you mentioned that this still met the 187 contract days. How does this impact student days? I know we had moved some things a couple years ago to accommodate some uh, snow days. Are they still there, built-in snow days? Uh, it'll or? be tight. Okay. Um, we have 164.5 student contact days as compared to 170.5. So that's, it'll, I mean, at most, maybe one, you know, we called it the free day, um, but it'll be tight okay. for any, any kind of catastrophe, not just no. Oh, and so these emergency makeup days on the calendar, are those new? Or no. this is, are, were they on the calendar when yes. we approved it? Or yes. the, the May 26th or June 2nd yeah. were on the 
approved calendar okay. for next year. All right, so they were already there. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, at, and this may just be my misunderstanding, but one time I thought that on the Wednesdays they they did PLC work. When does is that do we still do PLCs and if so when will that happen or when does that happen I guess and it, it varies and um, you know that's another thing that LFRL is looking at um, during the day during the plan time the, the 50 minutes okay. um, some happened on the um, early out Wednesdays so that that grade level team could get together and plan but around their PLC framework okay Mr. Barsness it, or along the lines of, um, so as we go through the days in um, L4L, L4L, there's still some things that are still being worked out, right? You mentioned like the different areas uh, from teachers or trying to meet students' needs. There's some of that that's still being worked out. Right. Right. Okay. You know, and, and some good questions came out of the meeting last night. <laughs> I tried to keep, keep my week straight. Um, you know, like, will paraprofessionals be played on this, paid on the six Fridays? I mean, they were planning on it. Um, it's in the budget, so, you know, we still need to get confirmation on that. Um, also, um, Senior High had asked for to get out 10 minutes early just so that they could get their 90, their blocks to work. And um, so it wasn't, you know, six minutes here and eight minutes there. Um, so that works as well. And then the early childhood education calendar, you know, that's, we've got to start fresh all over and plan that one. Um, the ABCD specials calendar, um, we'll go back to the drawing board for that one. Um, and then the AB GISH and senior high, or middle school and senior high calendars, because they have the AB days, um, will need to be reworked. We also had some um, teachers from senior high that uh, students had to leave early to go pick up siblings from uh, elementary school on Wednesdays as well that came that came up mm -hmm. yes and Mrs. Albers if I may I just wanted to since I was the one that kind of conducted the listening tours as well as we had some other staff members uh, that were present too and when it came down to the Fridays when teachers had the larger blocks of planning time overwhelmingly at the campuses they brought it up as a very as a positive and when I they weren't off work, so I was like, well, what were you all so excited about? Um, what, what was beneficial to you? And what they explained was the fact that the, it wasn't interrupted, that they really had the larger chunks, and even one person echoed that they felt like they were more prepared in their whole entire career because they had that concentrated time. And again, to Mrs. Uh, Aber's point, um, there were implications at all levels the high school, so we're talking about some of our, the way our system is designed and we want to improve some things. So for example, attendance at the high school and tardies, things that we talk about. Well, many of the high school students, they're responsible for their elementary siblings. And so the high school, they saw it as a concern with the elementary early outs as well. And then we also have middle school. And so when elementary kids are getting picked up, then that's going to impact our other students as well. And we had six different groups during the um, out of the box thinking. And it was a combination of, of different people and five out of the six groups. So as Dr. Dexter mentioned, the high school, they were more concerned about athletics, but they worked through it like, like we do, uh, compromises on both sides. But overwhelmingly, they felt like the Wednesdays needed to go. They needed to go immediately. They felt like it was long overdue. Um, and there were teachers, administrators, specialists, special education, all different types of staff members uh, that were there. And we specifically asked um, in my point for going, I promised the teachers when I went to the listening tours that I would look at it, right? And so we just didn't want to delay it. So normally we would like to do these types of things throughout the school year, but why wait a whole year when we can make a difference now? And that is the question that was posed. Should we move? Is the timing right to do it at this particular time? And they said yes, as long as we can notify families as soon as possible. And so I just wanted to provide that additional context. So just to confirm, it is 13, 13 and a half more hours of plan and prep. It was 54 before, and now it's 67 and a half. Okay. So it's significant. More questions? 
Thank you, Dr. Dr. Dexter. 11.3, Hello Hero SPED contract service agreement. Ms. Richards and Ms. Ingle, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you, board, again, for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. Ms. Ingle and I are here to ask the board to consider um, some information and approval of an initial special education contract with Hello Hero. I wanted to provide some context about um, why, from the preschool perspective, this is something that's um, critically important to us as we think about the upcoming school year. We currently have three preschool teacher vacancies. Um, which equates to about 90 preschool students who would be served in those classrooms. Um, we have, at, at this time, 511 applications for preschool. Um, with our current certified teacher um, capacity, we would only be able to serve 336. And so we really are at a time where we need to think about how can we be creative and think outside the box about how we can uh, find some staffing resources. And so as we have um, thought about this, our current ideal candidate really is somebody who has that early childhood inclusive endorsement or that early childhood special education endorsement. And we've been looking for those folks um, for a while and haven't been successful in finding those applicants. Um, and we've made some changes, again, to try to um, find some additional applicants who have just an early childhood endorsement. And unfortunately, again, we just haven't been successful in finding applicants to fill those positions. And so um, the new possibility that we would like to pursue is an opportunity to explore a Rule 11 waiver um, to expand um, some opportunities for teacher candidates under what we're calling an apprentice early childhood teacher. So um, preschool is um, under Rule 11. So some of the rules are a little bit different than might be in place for K-12. And one of those is the opportunity to find candidates who have a bachelor's degree with at least 12 hours of early childhood education credit, uh, or a candidates who have an associate's degree in early childhood, but who are actively pursuing that early childhood inclusive endorsement. Um, if we find those folks that we think would be a good fit, we have the opportunity to ask for a waiver of the current Rule 11 requirement. That goes through the Department, Nebraska Department of Education Office of Early Childhood. If they accept our recommendation for that, then they in turn make a recommendation to the Nebraska State Board of Education um, for approval. And then that gives us a three-year window for those candidates to complete their early childhood inclusive, but be able to teach during that time. Um, we are also pursuing in conjunction with this because we know if we have candidates who fall within this category, um, how can we help support them in pursuing their education? And so um, the Nebraska Teach Early Childhood Scholarship Program is an opportunity for these candidates to get some tuition assistance um, through the TEACH program and for us to be able to help support them. So although this is coming about as um, a time when, of course, we're looking at teacher shortage, shortages nationally, we really want to view this as a system that we can put in place to help attract highly qualified candidates, look within at um, folks who are working with us now in support roles, and can we help support them to eventually become those um, highly qualified teachers. But by doing this, because we're a fully inclusive program, we know that we have to find a way to provide that special education support that our students will need. And so our proposal, or a portion of our <laughs> proposal, is for us to contract with Hello Hero to provide some virtual case management services for us. These are folks that have expertise in meeting those legal compliance requirements that, of course, we want to honor with our students. Um, and so we compiled a list of services that we thought um, this service might meet for us, looking at um, finalizing IEPs, looking at all the paperwork that goes along with um, providing those special services, um, and how can we use Hello Hero 
as an effective way to meet those compliance requirements so that our teachers uh, have the opportunity to spend their time, resources, science, and art meeting the needs of our students um, and really allow them to focus on implementation while we find that specialist who can help us with um, providing the compliance expertise that we need. And so I'm going to let Ms. Engel talk a little bit about the bigger picture with Hello yes. Hebrew. And so in addition to um, our special education needs, um, compliance needs at OLC, we currently have four unfilled um, school psychologists FTE. Um, two of them, this is the second year we've had them, and we had two new ones this year. And we've tried extensively to fill those, and right now, as you all know, there's a national shortage. So those still remain unfilled. Um, we also have an increased need for case manager support, which is similar to what we need at OLC, as our um, upcoming apprentice teachers would need as they earn those degrees um, for the non-public sector. So this includes our parochials and homeschooled students. So this support could be used um, as well with our long-term subs. Sometimes we have long-term subs that have been helping us out quite extensively. They come in and they don't know how to use um, our synergy tool to complete our compliance paperwork um, that we need to to meet um, our federal guidelines. So this would support that as well. Okay. okay. Oh, hey. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Too many buttons. <laughs> Hands and pushing buttons. So um, tonight um, we ask you um, to approve, um, we'll come back and ask you to approve um, the opportunity to repurpose these existing four um, FTE um, of unfilled school psychologist position to enter an initial contract with Hello Hero for one FTE to support our pre-K um, as case manager one FTE to be utilized to support our non-public case manager needs, and then we would look to um, hire two virtual school psych positions. Okay. And then we would do it for this year, and then as it says, we'll, we'll see how it goes um, and reevaluate at the end of the year. Um, Hello Hero, Hero's excited about it too, uh, because they've done this some in the East Coast, and we've talked about is this something we could grow and continue, and maybe it's something in the future that would attract special educators to come here. Is something that we could grow. So, another button, I'll let you push it. <laughs> Any questions? Mr. Brown. Well, well, thanks for the um, creative thinking here of creating your own school psychologist, I guess. Um, I guess one of the questions I have, the school psychologists in Nebraska that are graduating, I know that number is very small. Do you happen to know what that number is? I don't know. This year, I think, like, three. Yeah, like, we have say, access to, like, three, yeah. possibly, and they all went to, like, back to their home or back out the country or with um, an upcoming spouse <laughs> or soon be spouse. And I assume that that probably isn't going to change anytime soon. So, I mean, we're, we're stepping into this now until we can find something. I mean, obviously, we'd love to have someone in person or four um, in this number. Um, I just... It's something we have to do. I, I don't know how we can't do this um, and just hope that we get more graduates from wherever um, that we can get them here and, and, and because this is certainly needed. And like I said, we know federally you have to have the paperwork and that's really the compliance part of this. Um, then our kids are not going to be um, underserved. They will continue the service, but um, just to make sure that the, the compliance part is done. So I commend you guys for thinking about how we can serve when obviously this has been a very difficult find. So thank you. Dr. Bros. Couple questions. Um, help me wrap my head around what a virtual school psychologist mm -hmm. does since I have some experience well, working with those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so help me just see what that is. And so these two psychologists were, are basically gonna help us do primarily a lot of our reevaluations. Okay. Um, they'll gather evidence, make sure they go through our template, gather evidence. They will use a Q Global system, interactive uh, assessment systems to test um, students uh, remotely. Um, we're actually, as our school psychologists, we're updating our technology. A few months ago I came to you, we're actually moving to that realm just so we have the capacity to shift um, and do things remotely as well. They have ample experience with that because I push back too. I'm like, man, we're trading two, you know, two for four. Is that a good trade? 
because they're focused just on that, they're highly skilled and have done it a oh, lot goodness, in the true. past few years. Um, basically, they told us they could generally get through about 100 evaluations and re-evaluations might be a little bit greater. When we have school psychologists on site, they're pulled a lot of different yep. directions. Not only do they do evaluations, yep. they're also serving students, they're attending other meetings. So their focus um, just on the evaluations really does help increase that number or that output. And my second question has to do with, are other school districts in the state using Hello Heroes? And if, if so, have you reached out to them to find out how it's working for them? Um, actually, we're using Hello Hero in a different capacity. Um, but in the state of Nebraska, no, this would be new. And Amy and I had the opportunity to actually meet with Amy Roan and Amy Burnell um, from the State Department to see, we ran this by them first, to see if this made sense to them. And they were very excited. They, were. Um, they liked our out-of-the-box thinking. They liked the way that we are looking at the compliance piece and utilizing other individuals to take care of that. Um, and on the East Coast, um, this company actually started and has kind of really grown up in North Carolina. They've utilized it extensively there. Um, I do think if this goes well, um, I do think other people in Nebraska will be looking at it. So. Mrs. Hinkle. Thank you. And thank you. So the theme tonight is the out of the box thinking. So we appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to mention that you did bring this, I know, to, to the facility and finance committee as well as the personnel committee. Yes. And did you the L4L committee as well? Or just those two? Just facility, finance, and personnel. Okay. But just wanted to mention that, that those committees had a chance to look at this in depth and um, really appreciated the efforts you went to this for this. So thank you. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you so much. 11.4 additions to extra standard schedule for 2022-2023. Dr. Dexter. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of work. Uh, we had a, a team that we pulled together and um, worked um, several afternoons um, over lunch. Just we just dug in to the extra standard schedule as it was. Um, part of the long term range, I just call it LERPI, long range um, extracurricular excellence um, plan, we, that was part of it, is that we review the extra standard, how we support it. Um, our consultant, Mr. Alexander, gave us um, ratios, you know, coaches to student, and what it is on a national level, um, what he recommended. And so we used that um, to when we were doing our planning. We also, you know, had category one through nine, and none of us could really d know how we know who goes where. And, and literally, it was usually Cindy and I going, yeah, it sounds like a category two or three. And so um, we put together the definitions of what each category is and um, what the salary movement is and then years of experience, how that is calculated. Um, you know, head coaches, summer activities and clinics are included in extra standard pay. And that was just kind of an unwritten understanding that some understood and some didn't. So um, we put that in writing. And then the volunteer coaches, and um, this it is time consuming. Um, it tends to stop people from being a, a volunteer coach just because of the paperwork involved, but we don't have a choice. We need to do the background checks and we need to make sure that our volunteer coaches have gone through the training that NSAA um, prescribes. We also cleaned up the, the salary schedule. Um, Stephanie Tomjack was wonderful about just putting on a spreadsheet. Um, it was on this, it looked like it had been typed on a typewriter. Um, that's how old um, some of it looked. Oh but uh, I'm sure it was. <coughs> it, it did look like that. Maybe Claris works, but I don't know. Um, and so we went through all of that. So then we came to the real work of the committee is to define um, how we fund um, extra standard positions, and uh, we had, I think, close to 7,000 to spend, and we have a need of 67,000, and most of that is because of adding um, the soccer. Um, our numbers at all three middle schools are really just exploding for girls and boys, um, and we ha haven't seen a decrease in track kids. I know that was a, a worry when we implemented soccer. Um, the girls wrestling is just 
I mean, it's unreal how the girls really get into that sport. <laughs> um, and, um, and I know as a, as a principal, and then I had to sit in as a coach a couple of times on wrestling, and when you had to watch a girl and a boy wrestle, it just didn't feel right. And so the, the girls' wrestling programs are, again, expanding and a lot of support there. So those coaching positions, we added the eSports League and um, you know the girls wrestling at the high school. We um, put in the unified bowling, which um, if you saw in the paper, um, those kids really rock. They, they did very well. And then um, we added reserve baseball and JV baseball um, because, again, that, that program really grows. And I know one of the questions were, will we co-op that program? Um, Cindy has been very diligent about making sure that, that those districts pay for the opportunity to play. And so it's based on the number of students and then divided by um, that per pupil cost. Uh, and then the assistant speech, um, we moved it around on the um, categories. So again, a big ask, but um, we've been just kind of adding and not um, really putting it into the extra standard, um, and now it's time to catch up. Mrs. Hinkle? So, um, I just wanted to share that I was I had the opportunity to, to attend the meeting where they talked about this and um, a lot of good conversations by the ADs and the principals and um, appreciate all the work that the central office did to get this ready too and stuff and you know when we saw the number versus what we knew we had there was a lot of discussion about can we prioritize these where do we cut these and you know or do we have enough to cover them and I think the, the main point was that it, it, something we are striving for with our extracurriculars is e the equity piece and just those opportunities for all of our children. Um, and so if the demand is there and, and we know that these make connections for the kids in the school, that it really is important that we make them available. So um, hopefully we can continue to fund them to find this in there so that um, if a child wants to do something, they will have the opportunity to do that. All right. My computer's freaking out tonight, uh, Mr. Brown. Thanks. I was just wanting to um, echo the comments, really. Um, this really comes down to activity or uh, and increased activities for kids, and that's really when you look at the list here um, and you see the sports or the activities that are kind of coming to the top or, or very popular it's just you know some of this was brought on by the kids themselves especially soccer in the middle school um, but then to see the rest it is just something that you, it's really easy to get behind and say you know if it's ad additional activities that we can offer kids and they're wanting to do it let's do it so I, this is very it's a long list but it, it's very I'm very supportive of this so thanks for the extra work <laughs> And, and one thing I forgot to say, um, you know, our, our coaches, they were, they had huge responsibilities, high numbers, and, and just made it work. But, you know, they're burning them, we're burning them out. And so getting those ratios down to doable and, um, is going to be helpful as well. And safety. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dexter. And, yeah. You're back. 11.58720 grading and reporting updates. Okay, so um, I think we've been working on this policy for a year now, um, but we've had great discussion, and um, you know, and and getting closer to solutions and and plans. But I really needed to push this forward that we align the policy with what we actually do currently. Um, you know, I anticipate there'll be changes as the team continues to work. But um, if you look at the two red bullets, um, those are the recommendations from the policy committee um, to delete the, the highlighted in yellow bullets. Um, and students are given multiple opportunities to complete a missing or incomplete assignment during or after the unit at the discretion of the teacher. 
When students do not attempt to complete the assignment or assessment, the grade is a zero. And um, the misconception was, we don't give, ever give a zero. We do, but we try all attempts we can to have that kid be successful. And, and, that, and we depend on the teacher to make those decisions. Questions? Anything else? Okay. Any questions? I was um, actually at the policy meeting when we discussed this. I was happy to be there. And I think this just kind of spells out what we've always done. This is what we talked about in the meeting. It spells out what we've always done. It doesn't, um, it takes away any gray area so that if people think we don't give zeros, well, it's, we do give zeros and now it's in the policy. Uh, we may be seeing this policy again um, in who knows when, but right now it is tweaked to a point where uh, the it cannot the understanding of it cannot be um, misinterpreted. And this will go on first read in July, second read in August on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. No questions. Excellent. Eleven point six twenty twenty two twenty three school year student transportation services, Dr. Schroeder. Howdy, folks. Uh, Grand Island Public Schools contracts with Holiday Express for student transportation services. A five-year contract for services was entered between Grand Island Public Schools and Holiday Express on June 10 of 2021. I've attached a copy of that service contract for review by the board, F and F committee, reviewed it upon initial approval and they reviewed it at their last committee meeting. A proposed transportation route schedule is also attached to this agenda item for the 22-23 school year. And the final draft of the proposed transportation schedule will be presented next month for approval by the board. Please note the current schedule provides for 171 days of student transportation. That 171 days recently changed. So uh, the calculation will be modified. We do have terms in the contract that says for every day over 171 or below 171, we make an end of year adjustment for that. So the calculated daily rate for next year is around $10,000. And so if you take off those seven days from the calendar from the 171 to the 164, it's a difference of about $73,297. And so the uh, transportation schedule I propose tonight will be modified in its final form and back in front of you next month for approval. Do you have any questions that I can answer for you? Questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. Oh, 11.7. Board resolution authorizing the district to enter into a lease purchase agreement for a dish machine. Dr. Okay. Schroeder. Yeah, we talked about this at last month's board meeting. We need a new dish machine for the central kitchen. And so the bids came in and the low bid was for 165,000. We've got some vent and some uh, mechanical electrical plumbing MEP work. HVAC work that we would need to do in conjunction with that. So we got a not to exceed bid from Jerry Sheet Metal in the amount of 25,000. So 25,000 plus 165 brings us to 190. The total that you would be approving the resolution it would be an amount to not exceed 200,000. So we've got 5% or 10,000 built in for contingency because trust me, I've, I've done this before and so has Dan. Things happen. Uh, they don't always just slide in and hook up. So attached to that agenda item is the resolution that you would please approve to authorize us entering into a lease purchase agreement in an amount not to exceed 200,000. I have attached the financing and corresponding debt schedule to this agenda item as well. 
We did talk about this in F and F over a period of several months. And as I said, it was uh, provided to you last month as an information item. So we would just need an approval of the resolution when we go into action tonight to make that happen. Do you have any questions that I can answer for you? Doesn't look like it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. 11.8 iPad Apple TVs. Kate Crow, how are you? All right, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Good evening. Get all hooked up here. Okay, I am here this evening with two Title I proposals uh, for you that I'm bringing for both information and action. Um, the first one, and both of them will sound familiar, I think, once we get into them a little bit here. The first one um, really started with Wasmer and Westlawn last year, and their original idea was that they wanted to buy some iPads with Title I funds for the purpose of teacher verification of student learning. It just made them more mobile. They could walk around the classroom. They could listen to conversations, look at student work. And then soon on the heels of that, they decided it would be really cool if they could project um, So what was on their iPad or take a picture of student work, so they added that and then realized they needed some updated projector equipment to make all their new things work. So it just kind of kept growing. Um, when they got them, they were very um, excited and enthusiastic, and I believe they presented to you um, at a campus highlight um, on some of the things that they were able to do that even exceeded what they were hoping. So they talked about how, of course, it went with their initial idea of teacher verify, but also helped with lesson pacing, teaming, positive supports, supporting curricular resources. Here's a picture of like the verification down here and what that looked like. Um, science they could project, they could progress monitoring, administer dibbles. Like they were so excited and found so many great uses for them. So of course, when they told the other title buildings and showed them this presentation, then everybody wanted some. So um, we put together a proposal to buy some similar equipment for the other buildings for $173,360. And again, that would come out of title funds. So if you have any questions about that proposal. Any questions? No. Are you, do you have a question? Oh, okay, there you go. Mr. Barsness. <laughs> no, thank you. And I just want to, um, I know we have a lot of informational items that we're putting in, you know, and everything. So we did uh, yeah, all this stuff. Um, just a good reminder of as information goes out, I know this was floating around as well as uh, some of the stuff that has not been talked about. But this item we've visited on committees as well as, you know, the calendar and the, the, the washing, the dish machine. So there's a lot that um, has we've done a lot of conversation so you know when the general public sometimes gets the information from just uh, social media sources that it's not uh, verified it can be easy to say well why are they going so quick so i was thinking as we're going through these items for the public it might sound like we're going through quick but all of these items we have been talking about and it's been discussed so uh, i know we saw a presentation a couple months ago with uh you were going to mention that um uh, and i can't remember the school but Wasmer, thank you. So we saw the engagement and we've seen just how, wor uh, how worth it it is for the students and what they're trying to do. So that's all I had to say. All right, and my next um, Title I proposal, let me go back over here for you. Um, this one is uh, pretty exciting too. We partnered, started partnering with FEB Tutor last year and they provide one-on-one -on -one online tutoring for students. Um, and we purchased a bank of hours that we used throughout the year. They've been a really excellent partner to us. They've been very responsive. They provide um, data analysis, wraparound supports, parent communications. They've just been really one of the, the best groups that I have had the opportunity to work with. And um, they did some data analysis for us and I was just gonna show you a couple of slides from this presentation from our fall to winter data. So they'll provide us with things like how many students served. So this was probably mid-spring, 587 students served, 7,000 hours um, of tutoring used, and then they'll do data analysis. So this was math, which was really what we focused on this year. So they compared non-participants in the program from the district 
to FEV, what they call participants who'd had a lesson or two, and then FEV tutor champions who'd been consistent users to show us what their growth looked like in their MAP and their NSCAS assessments. So as you can see, those non-participants grew um, two percentiles on average, but those um, FEV tutor champions grew about five percentiles on average, which is pretty significant in MAP. And we had some buildings who grew um, at almost twice that rate, so up in the 10 or 12 percentiles on average, which is really incredibly significant growth. So for the upcoming year, we would like to again purchase uh, another bank of hours from Title I funds. There are some options available and they'll really work with us um, with whatever we wanted to do, but really as we're getting down to the end of the um, fiscal year here for Title I, we just um, are looking at a couple of options based on what we have after we pay for Title I summer school and those things. So. That is what we would like to do with those funds. Are there any questions on that? Any questions? Ms. Wolf. I know you mentioned we're primarily using it for math, um, but what other offerings do they have? I was just curious. Yeah, they do offer um, ELA, but we found the alignment to our curriculum was a little tougher, and math just seemed like a more logical place to start for us. So um, I anticipate we may be trying some more in the ELA realm this year, um, now that we've seen some success here. But okay, Perfect. No, I was just curious. I knew, we, I knew we had math. I just didn't know what other options were out there. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Eleven point ten ten staffing update presentation. Kristen Irie and Mitch. <laughs> He's the tech support. I'm used yeah. to this stuff. Okay. okay. Um, good evening. Uh, tonight we're going to provide a staffing report. We're kind of pinch hitting a little because there's different pieces that I have regarding staffing and recruitment and there's different pieces that Mr. Roush will also present. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, we are starting out by really discussing the national state of education to kind of give an overview of the landscape, the challenges that collectively we are all facing. Um, some of the stats that we want to talk about and present tonight, attrition costs, retention and turnover, all education is facing all the same challenges. Um, it's not local to here. I think it may have taken a little longer to reach more concentrated and smaller and rural districts. Um, the big, large metro districts, we're seeing this much faster and much harder. Um, but it is a prolonged problem, and it's been a problem that's been, sadly, it started before the pandemic, and it was accelerated and exacerbated by the pandemic. So attrition costs right now across the country are costing districts over $2 billion per year. It's a lot of money, and attrition is everything from trying to replace the uh, resources to recruit, the resources to um, maintain, and obviously the escalating just overall costs of everything. Ten uh, teacher retention and turnover are, are abysmal. They really are, just nationwide. Um, there's a lot of teachers that are leaving the profession for a myriad of reasons. Um, everything from, as we've seen highlighted most recently, there's you know, concentrated issues around student behavior. There's pay and pension issues. There's benefit issues. Um, and then there's just better opportunities as things are starting to escalate in the workforce. There's many more opportunities for you know, better pay. Um, we all know that you don't enter education to get rich, um, but there's still a tipping point. You enter education to be you know, a dedicated public servant, as we all are, and that goes across the board. So about 30% of new teachers leave teaching, not just their schools, not just their district, within five years. So you have spent all the time, the resources, the money, you've got them in the door, you've put time into professional develop and mentoring and everything that goes along with supporting those teachers, and we're losing about 30% in the first five years. 
turnover has uh, certain pockets that are higher, um, the south of the country, um, much higher turnover versus some of the areas in the northeast of the country, a little bit lower. 51% of the teachers are rep report that they have manageable workloads. So to put that in context, 49% say that the workload is just too much. 53% cite that working conditions are the primary concern, and working conditions covers everything. It's obviously student behavior and policies and pay and absolutely everything. And about 23% of the teaching workforce nationwide is between 50 and 59 years old. 7% are older than 60. So what that means is we're going to be facing a attrition and retirement cliff. And we're already starting to see large numbers. So. Declining enrollment in teacher training programs. Uh, as was presented earlier, three graduates from one campus and uh, one education program, two from another, the numbers are dwindling rapidly. 24% less education graduates across the country from all areas of higher education. And 60% of colleges report declining enrollment, primarily due to the pandemic, but enrollment's just declining everywhere. All right, and I'm going to turn it over for Mr. Rausch to talk about what we learned in regards to community and uh, GIPS specific feedback around some of these issues, and then I'll come up back and pick up the rest. Thank you, Ms. Irie, and thank you, board, for granting me space to audible a little bit here. So just wanted to provide some information specifically about the superintendent listening tour and as well as the insight and impact for GIPS events that were held. Um, I'm sharing on those things because I was part of the team that helped support putting those events together and um, gathering data and, and, and reporting and those sorts of things. So that's, that's why I'm here. Um, just a quick refresher for everybody in the community watching at home and for the, the, the folks in the room as well. Um, at the beginning of 2022, Dr. Grover conducted or began her uh, superintendent listening tour across the district. This is something she had done before, I believe maybe five years prior and wanted to do that again this year. It's an opportunity for her as superintendent to spend time in every single building in the district with the, with the staff and the leaders there to uh, hear from them and gather insight and gather uh, information on what they view are ideas for the school district or pain points or challenges and what they're seeing and feeling within the school district. So they met with all of them, uh, totaling 22 groups. That includes every school, every, uh, f uh, every facility that houses students, as well as um, a group for just the administrators as well, too. And um, much of what was being shared, as you can imagine, especially as the semester progressed, is that um, a lot of what's being shared is mirroring these national trends that we are seeing, especially as it comes to um, retention, recruiting, teacher support, development. Um, so throughout these listening tours, we had gathered over 100 pages of notes of what was being shared from the staff directly with Dr. Grover. Um, and I do want to actually specify one quick thing that I forgot to mention. Um, the conversations were all curated in the same fashion as to, you know, produce some sort of consistency in terms of what are people responding to, right? What people are sharing is going to be unique, but they're responding to the same things. So then every uh, staff team had an opportunity to respond to the same questions. Those four questions were knowing where our students are now, what do our students need in order for them to achieve our desired outcomes, what barriers will we have to overcome, and how does our system need to change to overcome these barriers. Our world has changed. We are in a different place with education. How do we continue to empower, recognize, and provide our staff with what is needed in order to give them our support for what they need? And what areas of focus do you want us to consider as we move forward as a district? So the 100 pages of notes that we gathered from the staff across the district um, in response to Dr. Grover were, were answering those four questions. Now, we have 100 pages of notes. That's a lot. And um, as, as uh, Ms. Simmons, Mrs. Simmons can attest to, she took most of those notes. We, we, got, we got a lot because there's a lot of valuable stuff shared. So then what do we do with all of that, right? 
So um, we, we wanted to honor as much as we possibly received, but also do it in a way that is responsible and maintains the integrity of what was shared by our staff members. So we had a grant and we were able to elicit a third party group Advim, I believe, consulting, education consulting is who we use. And we, we gave them access to the 100 pages of notes and said, here's what we want. We want an executive summary that we can provide to our staff that highlights the most important trends and the consistencies and the concerns and the ideas that were shared throughout. But we wanted it to be as objective as possible, removing bias. So that's why we reused this group. So they produced their main takeaways. They had five major themes that were identified, and one of them was labeled as teacher support and development. And so we unpacked that in pretty big detail in our executive summary. Up on the screen is a cover of the executive summary that was shared uh, last month with every single staff member in this school district. And throughout the teacher and support of development um, we, we created um, some areas that were called um, GIPS plan for continuous improvement. We're going to unpack some of those in this particular conversation towards the end of our presentation. But um, what was shared by, by much of our staff throughout this section was, um, let me find spot, was, you know, desiring additional support in class, um, concerns around full-time employment allotments and how they're going to be able to continue to cover classes, um, suggestions on how to get creative with those sorts of solutions. Um, we uh, Suggestions about rolling out a new exit survey model, um, wanting to see more in-depth staffing breakdowns, um, desiring some more teacher autonomy clarity that the L4L team could help provide support. Um, have the district or central office provide um, some maybe additional support for principals to help better engage um, some of the things that are going on in the buildings. Also um, asking for us to take a look at employee benefits, those sorts of things. So th that's an awful lot of what was being discussed um, in this particular arena in the listening tour. And as I mentioned, uh, we do have some plans and some ideas for some continuous improvement. We're going we're gonna to get to that at the end of the presentation. We also hosted an insight and impact for GIPS uh, meeting, two forums on one day, one in the afternoon, one in the evening last month. Um, and this was out of a response to better engage our community, specifically on the topic of recruiting and retention within Grand Island Public Schools. Because I think everybody in this room and probably everybody watching would agree that when you are recruiting teachers to uh, join a school district, it's not just a school district thing, it's a community thing. The school district thing is a really, really big piece, but it's a community thing. They're bringing their families here, they're bringing their spouses here, they're, they're, they're wanting to set down roots here, and so we wanted to engage in our community in a conversation. Now, we had this conversation at a time that was also surrounding some greater um, maybe felt urgency and conversation going on on social media and other corners of the, the community as well, too. So we thought it was a timely opportunity. So um, what we did was we had over 100 um, we had over 100 participants in these sessions. We invited the entire community and our staff to join. We had over 100 participants. That does not include the staff that were there to help facilitate the event, and that does not count the table hosts that volunteered their times to help curate the discussion. So we had over 100 uh, business owners, nonprofit leaders, civic leaders, families, staff, retired teachers, even some students from senior high attended. We had a great turnout there. And we built up these small roundtable groups that people would be able to rotate through. We had a third-party facilitator for the conversation asking some very specific questions. Table hosts were taking down the notes for everything, and the whole thing was geared towards how do we better champion recruiting and retention within our schools. So the thing that I personally really appreciated about this particular event was there was a lot of difficult conversation in that room. There were a lot of people that were expressing some meaningful concerns. There were a lot of um, ideas that were shared. There were a lot of um, just, there were a lot of emotions, but I felt like it was good for us to engage the community in that capacity and to hear that variety of opinion and that variety of concern and, and addressing certain challenges. So again, we were talking about recruiting and retention. Challenges that were brought forward closely align, again, to a lot of the national trends that we're seeing, as well as what were shared during the superintendent listening tours. 
participants brought forward a number of ideas, some related to recruitment and retention, some related to other topics. Um, but again, when it comes to recruiting and retention, it sounded to us, especially as our third party moderator synthesized some of the notes, that um, a lot of them were geared more towards back retention and the concept of how are we supporting our teachers in the building? How are we cultivating building culture? Those sorts of things. They stress the importance of staff input when making major decisions. They stress the importance of and sharing the need for additional teacher accountability. And they also uh, stressed the importance of, you know, the continued emphasis on social emotional awareness and um, supports that we can do there. So again, um, we felt like that that was a meaningful event. Um, we are going to, uh, Ms. Irie is going to share towards the end of her presentation some of the more proactive things that we are going to be doing in a response to um, things that we have heard in those two capacities. So I think that is it for my section. I'm going to yield the floor to Ms. Irie to take us the rest of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roush. So the status staffing in Grand Island Public Schools, our presentation tonight is based in a holistic approach. It's not recruiting, it's not retention. We need both to be successful in the long term. So the numbers I'm talking about is recruiting, but we're also going to talk about some of the things we're proactively doing for retention because we have to do both in order to plan for success for long term. So preparing for the 22-23 school year, um, our priorities have been and still are ensuring high quality, full-time staff in our classrooms for our students, reduce the amount of additional class coverage that our certified staff has to do, and free up substitute teachers for more flexible support across the district. These are our priorities before, these are our priorities now, and these are what we have heard from our community, our teachers, um, everyone, that this has to be our drivers for success. So starting with recruitment, at the end of the 21-22 school year, we had 108 certified staff resignations and about 17 retirements. That's based on a general uh, date of April 28th is when we really kind of started accumulating that because of state regulations that we had to adhere to. So as of April 28th, we had 61 certified openings. So as of 1 p.m. today, because we were updating this up until 1 p.m. as we were still getting offers accepted, we had uh, three acceptances today, so we updated this today at 1 p.m. So as of today, we have 26.50 open certified positions, down from 61. There's uh, a number of uh, steps that we took to really attack that number, and I will unpack that a little, but um, that's 26 full and a .50 a half-time person. So that is also what we have planned based it on our projected enrollment numbers. So you can see the numbers here. Um, we have three early childhood, two in our elementary, five out of our 10 that we talked about in previous board meetings, the social emotional creative arts specialists, those are new FTEs that we're repurposing and bringing on, but we started with 10 and we've already hired five. Uh, five middle school <laughs> openings, 5.5, that's where half is, high school, and then of course six special education. So, Current GIPS certified opportunities. I don't like calling them jobs, I like calling them opportunities because that's really what they are. It's an opportunity to join a phenomenal district with really great people who care. So just to break down some of those larger numbers, um, elementary, excuse me, uh, early learning center, our preschool, there's three preschools. Our Dodge Elementary, we have one fifth grade. Howard Elementary, we have one first grade. And then of course, in general, we have the five remaining social, emotional, creative arts positions. For our middle school, we have three. So we have one eighth grade math, one seventh grade science, and one eighth grade science. And I'll, I'll pause there for a moment because STEM is a particular crisis in education right now. Science, technology, engineering, and math, Science and math, it, it, it's brutal. It really is finding qualified, high quality instruction, instructors who can deliver 
science and math, where it's an absolute crisis in this country. Um, Walnut, we have a seventh grade English language arts, and Westridge, we have a, a seventh grade, uh, excuse me, um, uh, English language. Uh, for our high school, we have 5.5 total. We have 1.5 uh, available teacher Spanish, English, aviation, social studies, and success academy teacher. And then of course, special education, we have school psychologist, um, special education for middle school, high school, elementary we have two, and then we have an SECL coach. So while we've been talking about the, the grim statistics and all the problems and the challenges, um, we'll start to really talk about some of the things that we're doing. We know we have this problem. What are we doing to address the shift and just the evolving landscape in education? So the first thing, uh, the quick and easiest that we're doing is we're expanding social media presence. We're taking many more of these opportunities to the people. We're going where they are. We're working consistently and much more closely with the colleges. Um, Brian Court, our retention and recruitment uh, coordinator, is boots on the ground doing a phenomenal job. And that's why we had three acceptances today, because he is out there. You know, we're, we're having a very strong presence in all the campuses. Uh, we haven't sent him to Shadron yet, but I haven't broken the news to him that he'll probably be going to Shadron. So um, if he's watching, he just found out he'll be going to Shadron at some point because we are everywhere in this state. So um, we're looking at, and we, are, we have approved, um, Dr. Schroeder has approved, uh, we're going to be offering student teacher stipends. That has been one of the methods that school districts across the country, depending upon resources and availability, um, and making that path into teaching much easier and a smoother transition. So providing some type of financial resource, excuse me, resources and support does really make a difference, especially now with the cost of everything. Um, we're also looking at a much smoother transition to full-time employment. Once we really have um, an understanding and we uh, have our student teachers in place, we're going to be moving very quickly to make sure and, and, and evaluate that they are the right fit and to bring them on, to, on board within the next semester or you know, sooner if possible. Um, we're offering signing bonuses to high demand. As we talked about, those STEM positions are high demand across the country. So um, getting out there with a larger and farther reach for a regional national campaign advertising and letting people know that we have these bonuses to pay, those type of things. Um, those are just some of the things that we're really doing to attack and be very aggressive on the problems because we know they're there, they're not going away. We're also looking, and as uh, you heard earlier, we're looking at alternative routes to certification. We have specific programs with uh, universities and colleges um, to provide opportunities for a pathway to certification while people are still working for. So we're looking at what's called a para to teacher. So our para educations, uh, excuse me, educators um, can enroll in a program that offers them a specific and carved out streamlined path into a certification and the ability to meet the requirements for becoming an educator in Nebraska. We're looking to support that program with, even if it's virtual on-site class attendance, having cohorts that meet and be able to follow through and have access to the technology and the space and the, the, the solitude that they might need, may not be able to do it from home to log in, we can provide classes on-site, even if they're virtual. Um, and then, of course, allowing them the flexibility to attend these classes. So. Um, one of the ways we were able to get the number down from 61 has been looking at our existing certified positions um, and reassigning to classrooms. So we looked at positions that were obviously certified, non-instructional. They were not assigned to classroom. These were generally building level positions. 
Um, they still met all the requirements for certif certification. They were wonderful educators that were not necessarily classroom and student facing. So we started looking at the opportunities to move educators around to fill the gaps we had. Uh, this allows us to provide students with current staff that will deliver high quality instruction. It also maintains a continuity of learning and it uh, minimizes the disruptions from daily shuffles around and from having to put in substitute teachers be the, if they're long-term or if it's a patchwork that we had to do last year to really get through of multiple substitute teachers. Okay, so for class sizes, this is what we looked at, evaluated, and analyzed in depth for a very long time, past few months, of figuring out the best way to serve our students, um, meet those needs, and still support our certified staff, especially our educators. So we have realigned class size um, and the enrollment numbers, I should say, pardon me, not class size, but the enrollment numbers. And based on the guidelines that we have and that we've provided, about, what did we say, the 40, uh, excuse me, we're about 98% is at class size guidelines or below. It's a very important number I don't want to skip over. We are aligned with our class size guidelines or slightly lower class size. 2% of our overall class size is slightly higher, but 98% is at or below. So focusing on retention strategies, we are looking to support our educators every way we can. So we're looking at concentrated planning times. The whole presentation you heard about Fridays, adding Fridays off, restructuring those opportunities, we're doing that now. We're looking at ways to attack this and provide the support we need to provide. One of our new and very effective programs is Discover Grand Island, where the aforementioned Mr. Court uh, takes uh, a lot of our new teachers around to various locations and there's activities planned. It really gives them a welcome to Grand Island. A thank you for being here. We welcome you, we appreciate you. Get to know the area, especially when we have teachers that are from not here. So we're expanding the support for our mentoring program. We're really looking at middle and high school because that's the feedback that we've gotten. That's where we really need to start with concentrating our efforts and providing that mentorship. The early childhood teach, uh, Nebraska teach, I think it's called, scholarship opportunities. We're supporting that every way we can to really focus on bringing more preschool and early education teachers. Uh, updated compensation model for, prepare for professionals, that is coming. We've heard the community over and over um, saying that we need to recognize the value and the effort and how hard our paraprofessionals work to support our educators. And our educators have said that. They have you know, repeatedly said that we need to do more for these people. They're also hit the hardest by all these crazy economy shocks that we have. And we have formed a benefit committee to start and conduct a full benefit study. We are hitting some roadblocks with our, our current healthcare consortium. So that is ongoing um, and we will do everything we can to keep that process moving. But there's been a, a lot of uh, disappointments there, but we're, we're not giving up. Um, we are also, one of the things that came out of all this feedback was providing additional parent volunteer initiatives at the school level. Continued leave and benefit consideration, um, it came up in negotiations and we're, we're actively pursuing that now. We're, we have a leave committee. We've started those conversations 
and uh, they will continue. We do have a new exit survey that was completely online and launched last week, <laughs> give or take, really the last couple days of May. And then we're looking at specific proactive strategies um, to support our campus and district leaders. That's an ongoing. It's a bullet here because we want to make sure people understand it, that we are doing everything we can, and there's always more we can do, um, but this is ongoing. This never ends. It hasn't ended before, and we're just picking it up. It's not ending in a month. This is ongoing. And that is all I have. I don't have a question slide. I'm sorry. But <laughs> if you have questions for myself or Mr. Roush, I'm happy to answer anything that I can. Thank you very much. Very thorough, very good presentation. Anybody have any questions? Dr. Bros. How's the Nebraska Department of Education Certification yeah. Office feeling about having student teachers assume teaching roles and getting them certified? Is that becoming an issue? Well, I'm sorry, we're live, I, I, right? I think I got the answer. <laughs> we're, we've had some uh, slowdowns with NDE across the board. Obviously, they had struggles with the pandemic, they had struggles with everything. So, there has been um, a, a, a choke of the pipeline of data and information. They are starting to move more quickly now. We have a really good um, rapport back and forth with things we need. Um, they have indicated uh, that you know it's necessary, and as long as they're meeting all the criteria that's established, they've been very encouraging of trying to be creative because they know the impact of having so few candidates coming out of ed qualified education programs. Thank you. Mrs. Hinkle. Thank you. I, I did um, appreciate that and all the work that you're doing. I know your, your department, just like many others, are working very, very hard, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of make a mention about the Community Insights Program because um, when we got to the question that that day and night about you know what are your ideas about making this better we often got blank stares um, because they are complex issues and difficult to handle but one thing that I, I wasn't brought up but from a board of education member standpoint you know for example like paying paraeducators more i know we've talked about that for years um teachers more and so forth is that the community can help us. One of the things we do the most, where we spend most of our time every year, is advocating at the state level for adequate funding. And the community members who want us to be able to pay more uh, to teachers and to paraeducators need to let our state senators know this. Um, because as we know in the last few years especially, the focus has been cutting taxes, cutting taxes, cutting taxes, and not replacing them and you have to get that money from somewhere. And even at the federal level, since special education was first founded in, in the 70s, they've never fully funded it. So community members, that's where they can really help us is by being those advocates along with us, because I think state senators get tired of hearing from the board members saying, you know, you need to fund us fully and so forth. So I just want to say that publicly that um, if, and then the other thing too is, um, with the behavioral issues and so forth is that's where, you know, from a family perspective, um, supporting the teachers, you know, m helping the child learn how best if they have a conflict with a teacher to work through it rather than maybe what they see in social media and on, you know, happening in our political world this day about how if you don't agree with somebody, this is how you treat them. Maybe just showing them how to work with the teacher with empathy and with you know constructive criticism and, and constructive dialogue. So that's where the community can help us in all of this as well. And we'll continue to advocate and be there as much as we can, so. Mr. Barsness. I'm having a Josh moment. It's taking me 30 minutes to formulate my thought. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, you know, I, I really appreciate, again, the, the hard work that everybody's putting in. Uh, I, we maybe, not just us as a school district, but everybody in the last six months, uh, we've been using this. We're different. We're at a different point, right? Things are tough. And uh, when we're talking about community, um, I got to hang out with some of the uh, LT leadership uh, tomorrow. They have a two-day program as well th today. Uh, 
I'll be visiting with them next when they come. Um, I appreciate as administrators all the work that is going in, all the teachers that are that are going in because yeah, we're dealing with some complex issues, right? And at, at times it might seem like there's so much negativity or pointing fingers things on social media that can get overwhelming but I, i'm just really super thankful for all the teachers that are taking other teachers to show them and to be teachable and coachable and saying that this is a great place to be because it is a great place to be we get to hear it uh as well that grand island is a great place a great place to be we're dealing with some complex things and i do appreciate some of the hard conversations uh the, you know we, we did the grading workshop we uh, push back we asked you uh, all of you are doing the same thing uh, administrators so there's a lot going on I just can't overemphasize that and uh, how important it is that we continue to if we're gonna continue to build our own uh, I was having a conversation with a friend who said you know if you if you're if you're a plumber you want to become a better plumber you don't go and ask an electrician if you want to become a better electrician you don't go and ask uh, you know somebody that roofer same thing if you want to be a better teacher you don't ask you know the uh, the community you ask a better teacher or you ask a better because you're trying to grow so i think how important it is for us to continue to look for all those those that are saying yeah it is tough how do we continue to show up um, i'm not dismissing that we are dealing with some stuff that we need to deal right that is happening at the state level it's happening at the national level but again, really grateful that um, our students, you know, as we look at the numbers, that's been a concern, classroom size, right? Well, we're not gonna get rid of any students. As a community, we need to look at, well, how we're gonna accommodate more students as our community grows? How do we staff more classroom as our community grows? So um, continue that conversation. Again, overemphasizing how grateful I am that everybody continues to show up. And yeah, we are dealing with some tough stuff, but we have great things happening in our community, so thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. Okay. I have the next item, too. Oh, 1111, 11, final contract for GIEA 2022-2023. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I presented for your review uh, is the Negotiated agreement, a uh, collective bargaining agreement that has been reached and finalized between GIEA and Grand Island Public Schools. It has uh, been negotiated uh, for months before it came to the resolution. It has been discussed with the Labor Relations Committee, who was the active negotiating partner, um, and the personnel. So are there any questions that I can answer? or attempt to answer. Does anybody have any questions? It will be brought later as an action item for you to vote and accept. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 11.12, .12, Knickerum contract. Mr. Fetch. Thanks, President Albers. Um, Last month, we uh, went through these numbers uh, and uh, approved to move the Knickerum project forward, uh, uh, two of the three of those SR3 projects. Um, this was uh, number one. So uh, page three on there, basically, the, <clears throat> the number didn't go down, I'm sorry, but uh, so uh, our lump sum uh, bid was the $1,631,000 for that project, and then also we accepted that alternate for $161,000. Um, so bringing this for information and uh, action later on, uh, this is just basically that, that follow-up that comes once we've uh, approved that contractor. So this is for Mid Plains construction. Any, any questions? Any questions? Doesn't look like it. All right. Um, 11, next. 13, Grand Island Senior High. So for the senior high uh, addition remodel, um, uh, for that we did not do any alternates, so uh, recommend to move forward with the contract lump sum of $3,689,700 uh, to Perry Reed Construction uh, for that project. And again, we'll, uh, this is for information and then action later on. Any questions? No questions. And 1114, construction update. So um, with these contracts approved, uh, we'll um, 
get rolling with the prep that occurs. Um, it'll take a, at least another month or so. Um, obviously, some of the barriers are going to be the supply chain stuff, but uh, we'll, we'll get started with just uh, um, our uh, construction meetings and work with the buildings of what that schedule is going to look like. Um, both these projects are to be completed uh, at the end of next summer of 2023. Um, the other part of my updates, the destruction update for the old ELC. So that's in process and uh, uh, it's, you know, everything's going real well. Uh, one thing, I've heard some comments uh, from the public. Uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, even though we're taking down a building that, that they liked, they appreciate that it's being done properly, that we're recycling a lot of those materials and, and not just throwing and filling up the landfill. So. Uh, just kind of comment there, so um, everything's going good. Uh, summer's starting to kick with our other project list things, and so um, things so good so far. So I'll conclude, and I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> any questions? Doesn't look like it. Thank you. Thank you. 1115 Superintendent Report, Dr. Grower. Thank you so much, Madam President. I'll be brief. We've had so many robust discussions tonight. Um, I did want to just highlight, of course, this time of year, we are working through a lot of trainings and preparing for the upcoming school year. Last week, we had our Leadership Institute uh, with all of our principals and an opportunity for them to really dig into their data and start making plans uh, for the upcoming school year. Today, we, our L4L team, they hosted our annual academic summit, and every school had a leadership team attending this summit. And around school improvement planning, you've heard some ideas that were presented here tonight. We had more than 100 participants, and today's focus was on building collective efficacy. Um, and the teams, they really walked away with clarity about their goals, their strategies, and just how to continue to build strong uh, school culture, and it's just all the parts and pieces uh, coming together uh, for the benefit of our students. I also want to give a special shout out to our communications team and say congratulations um, to their department for hosting their statewide NESPR conference. This is for the Nebraska School PR Association. It was hosted right here in Grand Island. Um, they had about 50 people from across the state and just a lot of accolades to our folks and a lot of learning. They also had some leaders, um, some national thought leaders who also joined the conversation. And much of the conversation was about, you know, addressing controversial issues, how to continue to engage your community. And I must say I'm very proud of how we continue to engage our community and try to get input um, and just navigating those waters as we continue to stay focused for our students. Um, also, um, I want to give a special acknowledgement to our campus principals. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we have been working on staffing, and they really had to think outside the box, Mrs. Hinkle, uh, in regards to making sure that we meet that first objective of full-time staff members in front of our students. And also to our teachers, the flexibilities, people willing to change positions and go into another position for the greater good. We've also asked a lot of our families, too, for their flexibility with our changes. But I think what this really demonstrates is the fact that we went out, we asked people for their thoughts, and we're responding to them. And so, and we're not delaying. We're moving quickly and taking action, and just appreciate everyone coming along with us. I did have a chance last night to attend um, Westridge, had an open house for their students that were coming from Gates um, and Conigrum. And, you know, the little kids' faces, they were anxious to see Westridge and their families. And one parent, he commented to our team um, as he was walking out, you know, just well done. We really appreciate how you all are being very accommodating and helping them with that transition. And I thought that was wonderful. And I just really do want to highlight Westridge's leadership. Uh, they just got right on it, started making phone calls to families, a wonderful presentation. Their attitudes have been so positive. And I will say even through our staffing um, conversations with their numbers being so different um, than uh, the numbers at Walnut and at Barr, 
they they work together to figure out where is the best place to place teachers based on their expertise and so really that collaborative spirit and everyone doing what it takes for Grand Island Public Schools it is alive and well and happening every day here so I just want to say thank you to our staff members because they have taken on so many additional tasks um, because they really do want to do excellent work on behalf of our community and then the last shout out is to all of our students that are participating in our summer program and just want to say thank you to Dr. Dexter uh, and work along with so many of the sponsors um, that are involved with that but we have kids everywhere it's almost like I need a map to try to find them because everything from fine art sports uh, to robotics uh, starting to kick off we just a lot we have a lot going on with our students and they're so excited and you know we've always talked about giving students more opportunities beyond you know the title one schools and opening up opportunities and through you know grants collaborations contributions from the district we have way more students participating in summer programs than we ever have and you can follow along on our social Social media at hashtag summer at GIPS. We're still open. The schools are still open, full of kids. Hashtag summer at GIPS uh, to follow along with some of the fantastic happenings uh, with our students. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Grover. Now we'll move into the action items. 12.1 GIPS emergency operation plan. Mr. Jacobson. That will be me. Oh, oh, <laughs> um, Dr. Dexter. Uh, uh, the emergency plan was presented last month, and um, as Mr. Jacobson says, um, uh, he put in um, just really following national, state, local guidelines, and we have an awesome team that worked to put it together, and, and it is an impressive document that um, others are asking to copy. That's awesome. Excellent. Any questions? No, no questions? Mr. Barsonis. Make a motion to approve the GIPS emergency operation plan as presented. Mr. Barsonis and Mr. Brown, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Thank you. You're staying up here, aren't you? Um, okay. Uh, it's my night. <laughs> yeah, 12 to <laughs> 2022-2023 Parent Student Handbook. And again, you know, I walked you through kind of page by page um, of the student handbook we do this every year again we have a team that starts meeting about February and um, they're, they're kind of old hands at it they know that throughout the year they you know sticky notes napkins put in a folder um, things to remember that when we go to to fix um, or update the handbook that they can use that so if you have any questions happy to answer those about the updates any questions on the handbook Mr. Barsonis no questions. I'm just, again, grateful that I know we started having those conversations, and uh, I just enjoyed the asking back and forth with high school principals and asking. I know we talked about dress codes. We talked about so many different things. Things move. Things change. And, you know, uh, when I went to a school, there were some things I couldn't wear that now they wear, right? So things change. We adapt. But I appreciate that there was a lot of robust conversations around that. With that. Um, I make a motion to approve the 2022-2023 Parent Student Handbook as presented. Mr. Barsness and Ms. Wolf, any discussion? Please vote. And motion passes. Thank you. 12.3, approve proposed changes to policy 8820 student fees. Yeah. You, you needed a break, so we, yeah. we let you sit up for a minute. Next. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this one is student fees. access. And so again, this was from the public hearing and um, just need approval. This is student fees. Student fees. Sorry. That's all right. Um, nope. Any questions? Mr. Barsonis. I'm grateful for all the opportunities we're doing for students. So with that motion to approve, I make a motion to approve the policy 8820 student fees as presented. Mr. Barsonis and Mrs. Jergens, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. And then parental now, rights? Yes, now it's parental yes. access to educational practices. Any questions on that one? No questions. 
Make a motion to approve, approve 9110 parental access to educational practices as presented in public hearing. Mr. Barsonis and Mr. Brown, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. That was for you. Twelve point five Hello Hero Sped Contract uh, Service Agreement. I just ask for you guys to approve. Mr. Barsonis. Thank you for thinking out of the box and making it happen. Uh, we make a motion to or I make a motion to approve the SPED case management contract with Hello Hero as presented. Mr. Barsness and Ms. Wolf, any discussion? Please vote. And motion passes. Thank you so much. 12.6 revisions to the 2022-2023 calendar. I'm back. <laughs> Dr. Dexter. Questions? Do you have a question, Mr. Brown? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so just to go back through the numbers, not that I want to drag them out, but we have more planned time with this calendar than the old one. Yes. 52 and a half to 67 was the change, right? So what's that? 17. So here's my question, though. Um, have we heard enough from the teachers whether or not this change is what, what was good? You know, just from the, the listening tour and the small group that met um, in May and then the calendar committee and the on-track or the uh, think tank group. Okay. I, I'm just a little concerned that, you know, we heard from the, from the listening tour that we want to listen to our t teachers and I just want to make sure that we're listening to our teachers to make sure that we've heard and I don't know if it's, you know, a popular vote, whatever, but some way I'd like to know myself is if, you know, what impact this would have. I, I think the impact would be good regardless if this looks like a good calendar. It's just want to make sure I buy in. So that's all I'm concerned about is making sure that we have buy in. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Dr. Bros. Yeah, I'm kind of with Terry on this. My question is, are we losing anything if we wait a month to vote on this? What's, well, explain that then to me so I get it. Yeah, please. I would say you're losing because of parents having to make decisions about um, daycare and stuff. And it is, the two o'clock dismissal is very difficult for working parents. And so if they have to plan for it, they need to know now if they need to plan for that or not. And, the, and the, or versus an all day Friday is my opinion and for teachers as well. So that'd be my opinion. Mr. Barsness. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm always happy to get more information. Um, I think in the process of things, sometimes on public comment, it can seem like, well, things that not happening, this is not happening yet. We have heard different things through the process, through the conversation. So I'm not opposed. So I have the same, uh, not so much as concern, but also a question of how do we quantify, right, the impact. Um, I agree of the, the more, that's one thing that if we could let families know sooner, the better. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm there in the middle saying, I think it's, it's a good idea to move forward. Uh, we've heard from, the, from staff, we continue to hear. I think sometimes just the process on how public comment comes through, um, but that's why we're here, to ask those questions and raise those questions. So um, I agree with all three of you. And the, the people I've heard, I mean, I heard from several people that, several elementary school teachers that were for this, that thought it was really positive. I'm, I'm conflicted too. Um, but uh, the, the fact of the matter is, um, I have heard from people who want this. I mean, like have contacted me and said, you are gonna vote for that, aren't you? I mean, you are going to make sure that passes, and it's a, it's elementary school teachers. So, um, but I'm conflicted as as well. But I'm going to go with uh, my gut. Yes. I think you need a. We're kind of moving into discussion. Okay. Oh, okay. And then have the discussion. Okay. I'll so. make a re uh, recommendation 
I make a motion to approve the revisions to the 2022-2023 school calendar as presented. I'll second. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Barsonis and Ms. Hinkle. So here's the discussion. <laughs> yes, okay. Do you have anything else? Okay, go ahead. So um, it, it is difficult. And I think we have to trust the listening tours. That's why Dr. Grover did them. And there's other things that we're acting on as well. And a third party put all of that feedback together. So to, to avoid the objectivity that might come in if we did it, or subjectivity, I should say, when, if we did it ourselves. So that's one thing. I, this is very similar to when we went to the continuous calendar. It was a very divided issue. Every time we talk about spring break during calendar committee, it's always a divided issue. It feels like 50% 50, 50 want it, 50% don't want spring break. Same thing with when we start school. Should we start before Labor Day or after Labor Day? Do we end before Memorial Day? Do we end after Memorial Day? Very, di very, very difficult to get, you know, like a majority on those issues. Um, and so the thing that I keep coming back to is that I've been on the Labor Relations Committee for many years of my board service, and every year prep and plan time comes up as a need. And here we are giving them 17 more hours of prep and plan time. And so I find, I feel like, because we've said, that as a labor relation committee, we can't really solve that. That has to be more at the building level and, and with administrators and so forth. And so I feel feel like we're fin finally be able to present that and um, understand though that there's, I understand that. And and so you, you listen to all the comments, but you're not going to make everybody happy. Um, and so I feel like it's like some of those other things, like with continuous calendar, we tried it to see how it worked and then we evaluated it and then made the decision to step away from it. And this might be one of those times where we have to try it, see how it works, evaluate it, and then you know, if we need to go back to it, we can. That would be my opinion. Mr. Barsness. I just that, I, you know, that's the, uh, there is some, um, I know there's other things that are being worked on. This is not a, okay, it's done and done. There's th so I, I have that confidence that we're still working out what's going to happen um, so I feel that that's a that's a plus than hearing what's happening with employee shortage the positions that we're still looking for some of the stuff that we can move on I figured might be best Mrs. Jergens uh, kind of in the same vein of what I've already heard I just want to state that I have personally heard from teachers that they want more prep and prep and plan time and to be able to say we can quantifiably prove to, um, to anyone that we are providing 17 more hours, am I correct? 17 more hours of prep and, I can't say it. <laughs> I'm so tired and I'm very sorry. <laughs> prep and plan time. 17 more hours. Um, to your point, Mrs. Hingle, see, it's done. I'm done and I'm so sorry, Hinkle. I'm just so, t you guys, I'm so tired, I'm so sorry. Um, it, it's just that if it doesn't work, we th then go back and reevaluate. But to try to say that after all of these listening tours, this is what we heard over and over, um, and then this is the move we're going to try to make. And quite honestly, I also feel like in our L4L committee meetings that you know we have work to do still. In, in terms of what is going to be uh, best for our teachers during that time and, and really listen to them, continue to listen to them. All of this is very important, but at no point are we announcing a finality. Um, this is just what we're doing to try to meet uh, our teachers' needs, and I just feel like it, something's got to give because what Dr. Grover expressed hearing and that her communications team expressed hearing over and over was that there was a need for more time. So this is what that attempt is. So I'm so sorry I can't speak tonight. Well, and we also heard how helpful those Fridays were, having that, that, that time to just work with their peers, planning and prepping, you know, without interruption, without students, was very, very helpful too. Mr. Brown. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I, I feel like if I just go with what I'm hearing from teachers, it's a wash. So that doesn't really help. But I, the more I look at it, the Wednesdays, 
um, being more often, I could see that being well in some feelings it would be helpful, but it's, it, it's, it's just like your normal plan time. It's just a little extra in one day. So to me, I think a bigger block of time would probably be more useful. And that's kind of what I heard as well. And the Fridays kind of look like what we've been doing with the mental health days. So it's like a continuation of what we've already been doing. So to, to undo that seems like we're going the wrong direction a little bit. So I guess I can be supportive of of making a change. And like you said, if it's not the right thing, we could always go back. But if we don't, when we can, like I said, it seems like we're going the wrong direction by taking those Fridays away. Yeah. Mrs. Hinkle, no, go ahead. The only other comment I thought of, because it, it might come up, and I just want to make sure we say this for, the, for everyone, is why couldn't you have the Wednesdays and still have these Fridays? Well, as we heard, this reduces the number of student contact days significantly to the point that now that those built-in snow days we had are no longer there. So we obviously can't do both because we have regulatory <laughs> obligations that we have to have so many student contact days as well. So good point. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. Okay. Make a motion. Oh, okay, so now, oh, that was our discussion. Sorry, I'm out of practice now. Um, okay, everybody vote. Motion passes. It's a dishwasher. 12.7, board resolution authorizing the district to enter into a lease purchase agreement for a dish machine. I would respectfully request that the board approve the resolution to authorize the district to enter into a lease purchase agreement for the purchase of a dishwash machine, not to exceed the amount of $200,000. Make a motion to authorize the district to enter into a lease purchase agreement with a bank in the principal amount to not exceed $200,000 for the purchase and installation of a dish machine. Mr. Barsness, Mr. Brown, any discussion on this? Okay, go ahead and vote. Motion passes. Thank you. 12.8, iPads and Apple TVs. Kate Crow. Um, yes, asking the board for approval for um, the purchase of iPads and Apple TVs in the amount of $173,000 for Title I buildings. Erica? Um, I win because yes. my light was on. <laughs> um, I motion to approve the purchase of iPads, Apple TVs, and project projectors for Title I buildings to support verification of student learning. Ms. Wolf? Second. And Mr. Barsonis? Any discussion? Do you have a discussion? Okay. Yeah. Um, just a clarifying question, and I'm sorry, I was looking for it and I just couldn't find it. How many schools does this impact? So this would be nine Title I buildings that would be purchasing. Thank you so much. All right, please vote. Oh, sorry, Mr. Brown. Um, and just to know, um, this is sold by your teachers, by the way. This, the presentation they did was awesome. You could tell the enthusiasm that they had. It's so contagious. So um, it's easy to get behind that because what they were doing, and it was just fantastic. So just throw that out there. Thanks. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, we're are we we're voting now. Okay, so everybody vote. Motion passes. You have your TVs. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be tutor. very excited. <laughs> and then um, uh, uh, asking for approval of a bank of hours from FEV Tutor to continue that one-on-one -on -one tutoring for Title One buildings. Make a motion to approve the use of funds to purchase a bank of hours to provide Title I elementary students with FB, FEV tutoring supports. Mr. Barson. Mr. Barsness, who was that? Dr. Bros. Well done. All right. Any discussion? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's vote. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm All right, second 12, probably 10. tonight from Dr. Dexter okay. being up here. But yes, um, so I'm presenting for you the uh, 
GIEA and GIPS uh, negotiated agreement for the 22-23 school year. Mr. Barsonis. Make a motion to adopt the 2022-2023 negotiated agreement. Mr. Barsonis and Ms. Wolf and Terry, uh, do we have any discussion? Okay. Okay. Huh? Yes. Uh, just a quick yeah. clarification. Um, so the contract is okay with our the uh, changed calendar. Is that correct? There is nothing in there one way or the other. Okay. Um, it does indicate that teachers do get plan and prep time, but there's not a prescribed calendar attached to that wording. Okay. Just clarification. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, vote. Motion passes. Thank you very much. 1211 Knickerum contract. Any questions to approve Mid Plains construction to do this project for us? Um, I'll make a motion to approve the Knickerum contract between Grand Island Public Schools and Mid Plains construction for the Knickerum Elementary HVAC system as presented. Mrs. Hinkle and Mr. Brown, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Grand Island Senior High contract. Mr. Uh, Petch. Any questions to approve Perry Reed construction to uh, do that senior high addition remodel project? Make a motion to approve the Grand Island Senior High Additions and Renovations contract between Grand Island Public Schools and Perry Reed Construction as presented. Mr. Barsonis? Second. Ms. Wolf? Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes. Thank you. 13 reports, Grand Island Public Schools Foundation report. I'm sure Mrs. everyone's Jerkins. just thrilled to pieces. I get to read something, um, <laughs> given that I can't put a thought together tonight. The Foundation Board will be making an official announcement this week regarding hiring of the new Executive Director. Thank you to the Board of Education for supporting the succession plan and hiring process. The Foundation received approximately 1,155 nominations for 367 teachers and staff for the 2022 Teacher of the Year program. The office is currently working on getting these nominations mailed out to those who were nominated. The corporate sponsor of this program is First National Bank. The foundation board will have the following business for them, excuse me, before them at their June 22nd, 2022 meeting. Teacher of the Year winner recommendation, Miller Legacy Scholarship for graduate, graduate programs of GIPS staff, 2022 audit engagement, potential contract for new executive director, banking resolutions to change authorized signers. And let's see, the foundation board will also review the 2022 scholarship program statistics, including feedback from reviewers and the annual scholarship application integrity audit. The foundation board does not plan to meet in July. And that is the foundation report. Thank you, Mrs. Jurgens. 13.2 NASB monthly update. Um, you can check your email or you can look on the website. Uh, I, I did have a question. Yeah. Just real quick. Mm -hmm. So since they, since this, oh, sorry. Okay. since the state board decided to n not go with the national board, does that mean we're not part of the national board anymore? Does that, is that what that means? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. We can ask that question. Yeah. Thank no. you. I have a. I have to call John Spots back, so okay. I can ask him. Uh, 14, notification of upcoming.